Good morning to the Center for Specialized Learning, everyone here and those who are online. Before I start, I would like to uh, say hello to Daniel Chalabarder, the Director of Political Science at the Open University of Catalonia, and Mr. Pedro Dominguez, Undersecretary of the uh, Penitentiary Affairs. Uh, welcome, both of you. So here can hold these criminology. Uh, meetings uh, with the University of Catalonia, uh, continuing with this center of studies. And it's at the forefront because this collaboration talks about key elements linked to uh, justice, the development, and growth of our system. This is one of our main objectives. I'd like to point out that, fortunately, the improvement of the pandemic has allowed us to hold this presentially uh, and uh, at the same time to take this uh, to tell you about what we have learned and to maintain the uh, advantages of online um, so that we can arrive to more people. People can uh, do uh, networking sessions uh, necessary and share their knowledge presentially and also with remote uh, through Zoom. So, and we are also recording for those who cannot connect. Now, this year we have chosen organized crime, transnational organized crime. This is a very broad subject, and that is why I like to see four different ways of view, but they are interrelated uh, to uh, show this phenomenon all of its dimensions. So we have people from academics, from the police force, from uh, the prisons, uh, also Mr. Varese of the College of Oxford, uh, uh, the United Kingdom, who's going to session, Mr. Geralt, Mr. Ekin, Mr. Carlos España, Mr. Luis Moreno, who will participate in the panel discussion, then Mr. Valsels will close the session. And with all of them, we will see how this phenomena has repercussions both at the personal level and more widespread and global, such as uh, how they affect the economy, the society, and through these different international organizations. And to finish, as I was saying at the beginning, I want to. Uh, of course, this uh, model, uh, this is a tradition holding these meetings to mix the world of academics and uh, professional world because through this we get uh, the of this knowledge in this field. And thanks once again to the University of Catalonia for their commitment to continuing to collaborate and to celebrate these meetings. Also to thank all of these speakers and of course those of you here. Um, because without you, uh, the public, um, we, we, we have nothing. So I hope that you enjoy this interesting meeting. Very helpful to you. Thank you very much. And I will now give the floor to Ms. Raquel Chalabarde, Director of Political Science in the University, Open University of Barcelona. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I wanted to welcome, I'm not going to say too much, but I am very delighted to be here in the 11th meeting on criminology, um, dealing with organized crime. We are very happy. This is like another step in the continued collaboration that we have for so long between uh, academic and uh, the rest of the courses and justice. And I would like to uh, thank Antonio Linde, the director of criminology, and Mark Ferrol, the director of uh, research in CESIC. And in the end, all of this is added work to what we have been carrying out. So we are very happy to hold this 11th session, this 11th meetings that are transversal, as we said, in 
studies of political science and law. We have a, a workshop uh, in criminal studies. This is a branch, and this is also one of the actions that give more visibility to this uh, subject that we have chosen. Um, so, because it has widespread affectations in international relations, in politics, and journalism. And so we are delighted to be able to offer this from the university collaborating with the Center for Further Studies in Criminology. This is what we can do from the university. So it is more than the degree on criminology. Uh, we also have master's degrees, continued learning uh, on cybercrime, um, conflict, business security, governance, global governance. And so I encourage you, all those of you who want to continue learning to uh, give a look at all of these courses that we offer that are very interesting. I am very happy to be able to be here, going back to normality. This is the first time that we once again meet presentially, and also thankful to the Center of People Studies for their excellent work. Um, lastly, in the past years, we've had the chance to collaborate closely with them. Mark is part of the rectory board. And so, and, they are, and so we are, of course, delighted to be able to continue to work uh, with this activity. So, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers. And now uh, I give the floor to the director. Okay. Pedro Dominguez, Director of Penitentiary Management. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the walk for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Organized crime, transnational organized crime uh, in prisons, which we will be dealing with today. We're working on this. And there is another branch, which is the affectation, the, both internally, it has a dual affectation of the institution itself and the institution itself. Sometimes we have uh, abnormal conducts. So we are looking at a model of information that we are developing where we try to detect all of the information for two purposes. The first one, which is obvious, if there is uh, have an affectation in the uh, living together, um, there's something that from within the prisons This can be coordinated together with the police. So with some of the risks that we're working on, we try to detect and manage one of them are organized groups. Not, not exactly the title of today's conference, but people who uh, have certain profiles and are connected. So we hope that this is, um, an interesting meeting for all of you. Thank you very much. Pedro, thank you. Raquel, and okay. Now we will continue with the inaugural speech. We will begin 
of the Univer Open University of Barcelona. Good morning. Welcome to this uh, event on criminology. Unfortunately, due to space restrictions, this year we have only had a reduced number of uh, physical attendance to the event because the inscription uh, was very successful and we filled all the positions very quickly, which makes us very happy because clearly year after year, we continue to have followers uh, interested in the different subjects that we present. And we decided to expand the event um, digitally through streaming. So I would like to welcome also everyone who is connected to the session and listening to us from the distance. Organized uh, crime is something that we've discussed before in this series of events. Uh, because we've had uh, speakers like the speaker that we will have this morning that we're fortunate to have with us. And I would like to thank the five experts that will be with us this morning for their availability and for their willingness to be involved in this event. I think that's all I will be able to, to say today. So I would like to thank also all of our, the members of our team in the Center for Legal Studies for their efforts in organizing this event. And I would like to thank also Mark Balsens, who has helped us a lot as an expert in the organization and I've had the opportunity to listen to him. He will be uh, responsible for the closing uh, ceremony. And before we start with the conference of Professor Valsese, this conference will be presented in English. Uh, those of you here presentially have uh, translation receptors where you will be able to select the channel for uh, Spanish or Catalan. You can listen to the translation in either one of both languages. I think that and for those of you who are um, connected through Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, you should see the option to connect either in Spanish or Catalan and, and listen to the translation. If you're here, you will be able to uh, address your questions in Spanish or Catalan to Professor Varese. He will be able to hear your question translated into English. And for those of you working uh, or listening uh, on Zoom, uh, we would really appreciate your asking questions through the chat because in this way we will collect your questions and uh, present them to uh, Professor Varese later. After the presentation, we will have a few minutes for questions or comments and you will be able to, in, I insist, do it uh, directly here if you're physically here, presentially in the room and otherwise do it through the chat. I would like to introduce Professor Varese, who is Professor of Criminology and Senior Researcher in the Northridge College in Oxford. His main area of re uh, research is organized crime. He has written on Russian methods, the uh, history of crime in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, pirates in Somalia and application of uh, social network analysis to for criminological research. He's currently involved in research projects on the dimensions of governance for organized crime in the United Kingdom and also in uh, Russia. He has authored many scientific authors and monographies which are a reference for organized crime and which have been translated to eight different languages. Having said this, I would now like to give the floor to his presentation entitled Production, Trade and Governance, a new approach to the study of organized crime with empirical applications. Forty minutes 
maybe, uh, is um, um, the topic of uh, trust, protection, and governance. And in a sense is how I got into this topic and what are the key questions that interest me in this uh, research. So it's, it's about what I'm interested in and I hope you will find it relevant uh, uh, for your work. Uh, so if I just press this, I go far right. So this is a photo of me in my uh, university. Um, that is the college where my uh, fellowship is attached, Nafid College. I was doing an interview on Sky News uh, and uh, I was called a mafia boss, <laughs> but maybe that's not, uh, since there is a lot of police here, I, it's not correct. Um, uh, and this, then it says mafia criminologist, which again, it's somewhat correct, somewhat not. I mean, I'm a criminologist, as you kindly said, I'm a professor of criminology at the University of Oxford. Um, and my name also is misspelled, so I'm not called Frederico, I'm called Federico. Um, but anyway, I thought that was a, a, a fun uh, um, way to introduce the fact that I have been studying, to be fair, uh, mafia organizations for uh, most of my, uh, of my life. Is, is it okay? Yeah. Uh, so what I want to do today is uh, uh, give you a talk uh, about, uh, as I said, the research questions that have um, interest me and uh, somehow my zigzagging around the topic of, uh, um, of uh, is this the new version of the presentation? It looks like it's the old one. Um, did you upload the new one? So I have two versions of the presentations. They're pretty similar to each other. Yes. Yeah, it's not this one. No, I think it's not. It doesn't matter very much. They are very similar to each other. But uh, um, what I was uh, going to tell you is that I have been thinking about the problem of organized crime. Is it? OK, well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's fine, they're all similar. So I've been thinking about the question of social order, how societies are organized. Um, and uh, I've, do, I've done that through the study of uh, organized crime. So the reason why I find organized crime very interesting as a research topic is that it allows us to think about areas of the world, especially Okay, that's better. Uh, especially illegal markets are organized. So my initial sociological interest was about social order, and I found the study of organized crime to be very conducive to the answer of that uh, fundamental question. I try to speak slowly, so for the translator, I usually speak very fast, but I think this is a good, uh, a, a good idea not to speak too fast. Um, so what I want to um, address today is uh, some key questions uh, like trust and protection, which are my theoretical interest. Um, is there a Russian mafia? As you kindly reminded, I have worked a lot on, on the Russian mafia. That was my PhD thesis. Uh, of course, it's now a very relevant topic because of the current war and how do mafias adapt to this um, issue. We were just talking about that now. Uh, also, um, how do mafias move? Uh, obviously, this is a discussion on transnational organized crimes, but how easy it is for a mafia to move from one place uh, to another. And whether mafias are a cultural product. So are mafias a product of a particular territory and they are very different from each other across the world or are they quite similar actually across uh, the globe? And, and then I will mention uh, the recent project I have on governance and, uh, and protection. So as I said, this is a bit about me. Uh, so when I was uh, quite young, I went to do a, a master's at uh, King's College in Cambridge in 1990. So it was a long time ago. Uh, King's College Cambridge at the time was a very thriving intellectual community. It was a really fascinating place to be. Uh, in the same college, there were great uh, scholars and academics, 
One was Ernest Gerner, who is a really famous, uh, unfortunately now deceased uh, anthropologist. He has written very bo famous books about um, nationalism, but also about social order in, uh, in, in, uh, in Africa, Northern Africa. Anthony Giddens, of course, was a professor of sociology there. Uh, Bernard Williams was a very famous uh, philosopher. Unfortunately, he also died. And Caroline Humphrey was a professor of anthropology, and she had worked a lot in, uh, in uh, Russia, especially the Far East uh, and Mongolia. And so she had done fieldwork. And the research center in, uh, in Cambridge was a very thriving uh, community, and they had a lot of projects. One of the projects they had, which involved all of these yeah. people, was about trust, uh, the concept of trust. Uh, it was uh, starting to emerge the idea that uh, although competition and um, it's important, people also have to cooperate, and an issue that is really crucial <laughs> in, uh, theory of, uh, the functioning Hola. of market economy is that people have to trust each other to abide by the rules. Um, so this uh, book came out uh, at the time when I was a student, or just before I arrived <laughs> in Cambridge, which was edited by Diego Gambetta, who was a professor uh, there of sociology. And uh, he uh, as a, um, so this book uh, involves a lot of the authors that I just mentioned, uh, Gellner, for instance, Bernard Williams. And he had this definition of trust, which is quite academic, but I, I hope you can uh, follow it. So trust is a level of subjective probability, uh, which an agent assesses that another agent or a group of agents will perform a particular action both before he can monitor his action and in a context where it affects his own action. Now, this is very complicated academic uh, definition, but it basically means that if you want to trust somebody, you take a risk. You take a risk that the person is not going to do what she has promised she would do. So you lend the book to a student, the student promises to return the book, but she might not return the book. So there is a fundamental problem of uh, trust in social relations. How can I be sure that the person in front of me who tells me that uh, she, she's going to do what she claims she's going to do will do it? And that has been recognized as a central problem of social order, as I said. And so there is a person that trusts, a person that is there receiving the trust, and you have some sort of belief about how this person will behave. And you have to make some strategic uh, calculations of whether the person will or not uh, be believe, believe as, um, as planned. Um, so this is a very theoretical discussion, but uh, this author, Diego Gambetta, uh, then uh, wrote a book, uh, uh, which is this one, on, uh, on the Sicilian mafia. So he applies this grand theory of trust to the Sicilian mafia. And uh, the way he defines the mafia there is that the mafia is an organization that provides uh, uh, protection when there is no trust. So when you cannot trust a person to do what she promises to do, uh, there is an agency, an, uh, an organization called the mafia, in this case in Sicily, that provides that uh, uh, certainty. Uh, so he sees the mafia as that particular agency that solves the problem that we have in criminal markets. So in criminal markets, the problem of trust is massive because people promise to deliver drugs and they don't send it to you. People promise to pay what they have uh, received and they don't give it to you. And yet, uh, uh, if the mafia is there, if a mafia as defined by uh, Gambetta is there, these transactions happen more easily. Are you still with me? Does it make sense? Yeah. So this is what uh, I found really fascinating because in a sense, it was applying this grand series of social order and trust and, um, and, and ultimately issues of government to illegal, uh, illegal markets. Um, so one of the, a number of propositions in, in Gambetta's book uh, are that uh, mafias are not just about extortion. You know, mafias actually do do something. They do provide a service which is uh, protection. 
they, of course, they might force their protection on the people, but ultimately the reason why they survive is because they do something that is needed, that is necessary, that people welcome ultimately. It doesn't mean that these are good organizations, it doesn't mean that they're ethical or they do it according to the rule of law or justice, but it means that some people benefit from their existence, which also means that it's very hard to get rid of them because there is a, a constituency, some people who benefit uh, from it. So they're not just about extortion, they do provide a service. Uh, and, uh, and third point that really fascinated me at the time is they emerge when uh, there is a, a massive transformation in the economy. There is a transition to the market economy. So Gambetta was studying the end of uh, feudalism and the beginning of a market economy in uh, Sicily in the 19th century. So Sicily is a particular case because uh, market economy or capitalism arrived very, very late in the 19th century. You know, in England, it arrived in the 16th, 17th century. In Italy, it arrived very, very late uh, and also very quickly, overnight almost, uh, in uh, uh, between 18, 1806 and 1812, most of the land which was owned by the, the barons uh, as, was uh, privatized overnight. So um, it went from 6,000 to more than 30,000 acres of land in private hands in a matter of 10 years. So the transition was very, very fast, and yet uh, it was not well organized. Property rights were not very well defined. People didn't know who owned what access to water was really un, uh, unclear who had access to water for irrigation. So the transition generated a demand for protection that the state was not able to, uh, to supply. Remember at the time when I was there in the 90s, something very similar was taking place in the Soviet Union, of course, because the Soviet Union was coming to an end, had just come to an end, and a market economy was arriving. Was there going to be a mafia there as a consequence of the transition? The uh, final point uh, in uh, Gambetta's book is that mafias do not move. So despite we talk about transnational organized crime, mafias actually are very, very localized. They, in fact, he finds that most of the Sicilian mafia is in the Western part of the island. So not even in the all of the of the island, um, so they don't move. The mafias do not change and do not move. Um, in fact, they are like a mining, you know, it's like a mine. A mine cannot be moved from Sicily to Northern Italy. Um, obviously, this is a very controversial uh, statement. So that was motivated me to study uh, organized crime and the mafia. And uh, in 1994, as a, as a good PhD student, I wrote my first article in English uh, asking precisely that question, is uh, Sicily the future of Russia? So can, in a sense, the Russian mafia emerge as a consequence of the transition uh, to the market economy? Very much like in the Sicilian case, uh, Russia was going through a transition. Now, the transition was not from uh, feudalism, obviously. Uh, it was from socialism or state cap state uh, run economy market uh, to state planned economy. Uh, so we're going from state planned economy to uh, market economy. And yet uh, there was something very similar because property was becoming uh, diffused. People started to finally own property, exactly as you have in feudalism, in the transition from feudalism to uh, the market economy. So I wanted to ask myself, is it possible that such a mafia might emerge? And this is a, probably not very easy to read, but the, the sort of the diagram that I have in that paper is that there is the end of the monopoly of, uh, of uh, the means of production. Uh, transactions increase, of course, people start to exchange. And once you have people exchanging, the problem of trust comes back because you now have property, you have to sell the property and somebody has to buy it. So how can you be sure that people will abide by their word, what they told you they will do? And normally we have contracts, we have a functioning market economy that if people disobey their 
promises, you can take them to court. If the state is not functioning, then the demand for uh, protection, if it's not met by the state, may be uh, met by an autonomous agency, which uh, could be the mafia. So that's what I was trying to do in that, uh, in that graph. Um, that also tells us that mafias can emerge in new territories uh, from local conditions, not necessarily because they move from one place to another, but because the conditions that have given rise to the mafia in Sicily might also uh, emerge in a new place. Uh, so after I wrote that article, I decided to go to Russia and to try to do ethnography and field work in uh, to see on the ground whether this was true or not and how things were looking on the ground. So I was trying to find all the photos of myself. Unfortunately, I should have turned that around. That was me in the train uh, going from Moscow to Perm. Perm is where I ended up living for one year in the 90s, 94, 95. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's in, uh, in, in at the border between European Russia and, uh, and Siberia. So it's uh, usually, it takes 24 hours by train to travel from Moscow to, to Perm. Perm is a large uh, city. There are 2 million people live there. It's a quite industrial city. It's a very Russian city. So there are no major minorities there. And um, uh, I decided to choose that place to check whether the hypothesis that I wrote in the article uh, were uh, correct. Um, so this is the core of my PhD uh, that I did in Oxford. Um, I studied really legal markets, so I didn't study drugs and prostitution because it was too dangerous, I thought. I mainly studied how people settle disputes and um, come to agreements in legal markets, so about commodities that are legal. Uh, so I went to Perm, as I said, I did an ethnography of the city. I lived there for uh, uh, a year, more or less. Um, I also got married there. So the person from Perm eventually became my wife. So I spent a lot of time there. Uh, I was studying not only um, sort of uh, the mafia, but a lot of the legal system that these, the legal system work. So I collected data on court cases, you know, how many cases go to courts. Are the courts effective in settling disputes between um, businessmen, uh, business people? Uh, I had a lot of data on social mobility in the city, what happened to people before the Soviet Union and after the Soviet Union, what kind of jobs they entered after the Soviet Union. So did uh, the people that were important in the Soviet period became important in the post-Soviet period or new people arrived. Um, I interviewed those who used the, the state, so went to court. And also I interviewed a lot of people who did not go to court and did not use the state to uh, provide protection. And I observed the court. And I also interviewed a lot of little businessmen, uh, mainly men who were uh, running little kiosks in the, in the city. So this was the very beginning of, uh, of the market economy, the very beginning of, of capitalism. And in a sense for me, it was very exciting because it was the, the first time, I mean, probably the only time in my life I could really see the birth of a, uh, of a new economic order of such a magnitude. Again, these are some of the photos that I was trying to find from the time. Uh, these are the little kiosks that I um, interviewed. I, I did a lot of interviews of people who were running this particular kind of establishments. The one that I'm standing in front of here was burned down because the person had refused to pay uh, protection money to the local gang, the local mafia. And uh, the selling person, the, the girl who was selling uh, in the night was murdered. I mean, was, was killed because of the, of the fire. So it was a terrible story. Um, and so I was doing interviews. I pretend to be a tourist. And so I got, I got a, a, a photo of it. Um, so what did I find when I went to, to Russia? Um, a lot of what Gambetta was saying in his book in, on Sicily, I actually found it also in the case of, of Russia. Under certain conditions, the mafia does not engage in extortion. It does provide a service, 
So a lot of the, uh, the job that the mafia was doing for the uh, kiosk owners was to reduce competition. Uh, now the kiosk owners that, um, whose kiosk was burned down had refused to pay protection money and was charging, was charging uh, a price for his goods that was less than the price charged by the other kiosk owners. So the other kiosk owners were actually quite happy that the person was punished because he was undercutting uh, their uh, market. So the mafia, although if we look at it from the point of view of the victim, i.e. The, the person whose kiosk was burned and of course the person who died, that was um, extortion and pure horrible violence, which it was. But on the other end, the, those who paid protection money, uh, the other kiosk owners um, were quite happy. So the point here, the general point is that extortion is a point, is a matter of point of view. And it depends who you are. If you are the, those who are protected, you're actually quite happy about it. And um, now I also found that the service the mafia was providing was not always good. Sometimes it was actually quite bad, but it, it, so they were not providing a very good protection. Uh, and sometimes they were actually quite lousy at it, but it all compares to how good was um, the state, in, which also was very, very bad. Um, I also found that protection should be interpreted in a quite broad sense of the word, in a broad sense of the word. It wasn't just uh, uh, protection over specific contracts. Protection also included access to credit. A lot of the a big problem at the time was that banks were not giving credit to small businesses. So the mafia was actually giving access to money credit for, for a fee, of course. Uh, it was also punishing deviants in the community. So if somebody had been a pedophile or somebody had been a, a engaging in behavior which was not proper in the community, they would punish them. Um, it didn't seem like a market. It's not that it was like a market for protection in which you can choose the protector you want. There was only one. <laughs> so although uh, Gambetta says in his book, uh, the mafia is involved in the market for protection, it's not exactly a market. It's more like a, a state type of situation in which you just have one supplier. Um, but I did find that the transition to the market economy generated a demand for protection that was not met by, by the state. However, it was also different from Sicily because the, there was the former nomenclatura that used to run the Soviet Union and run the city in, in Perm that actually did not need the mafia. So there was a stratification in the demand for protection. If you were from the old elite, you really could have selective access to the state, which was very corrupt and very partial. So I hope it makes sense that there was a key difference between Sicily and, uh, and, uh, and Russia, that uh, in, uh, in the case of Russia, there were two sources of protection. Neither of them were uh, universal and neither of them were open to everybody. One source of protection was the former nomenclatura and another one was the new mafia. So paradoxically, the mafia actually protected those who were new entrepreneurs. Good, are you with me? <laughs> we're still in Russia, right? Uh, uh, so then I wrote a book. I wrote a book called The Russian Mafia, which is this one, um, Private Protection in the New Market Economy, uh, which came out in 2001. That was my PhD thesis. I was uh, very fortunate that the writer John Le Carré, who is a great uh, novelist and unfortunately died very recently, who became a good friend of mine, uh, liked the book and uh, called it enlightening. <laughs> so I was very happy. I don't know if it helped sell copies, but uh, um, it was great for me to have his endorsement. Uh, he was very interested in Russia and, and the Soviet Union. So we collaborated a lot on many projects in after this, um, including some of his novels and, and, and movies. Uh, so it was my claim to fame instead of to be a footnote in his uh, production. Um, now, so the, the point of this book really is to show that there are local conditions that gives ra give rise to a mafia, local conditions that give rise to a mafia. And um, 
those can uh, emerge in new territory. So a mafia can emerge in Northern Ireland, can emerge in Iraq. It's not only a product of Sicily. Uh, as we know, there are mafias in Japan, there are mafias in Hong Kong, there are mafias in, in of course, in New York cities. Um, uh, this is a, um, the guy that I interviewed called Zikov. He was the, the boss of the, of the mafia in, in Perl, the one on the, on the left. And it's a picture from uh, a, a web page. Um, and uh, he is um, having uh, drinks with two other people from uh, uh, Kutaisi, which is a city in Georgia. And my guy is, is from Perm. When I, what I discovered at the time when I was in Russia is that the, this guy who was the boss of the city um, was connected to other bosses around Russia and the former Soviet Union. In fact, around the world to some extent. And this was, um, he was not just uh, on his own. He was part of a broader criminal fraternity that had existed in Russia since at least the beginning of the, um, of the 20th century. Uh, and this uh, fraternity uh, is, uh, is called the Vori Zakonye. So um, the Vori uh, are in effect, uh, what I argue are the Russian mafia. This vo so the expression in Russian vor zakonye, vor means uh, literally thief, but really it means a criminal. It means a criminal. And zakon, of course, means the law. Uh, so the criminal code is the zakonni codex. No? So the zakon in Russia simply means the law. And in this context, the word zakon means a code of honor. So the correct translation of this expression is, um, in my view, a criminal who abides by a code of honor. I'm still okay, right? If I, yeah. And so this guy that I was interviewing and who was the boss of the city was a member of this fraternity uh, that had bosses all around uh, the former Soviet Union, Russia, Georgia, um, and also parts of Europe. Um, now, there's, there's a lot of text in this, uh, in this um, slide, so I don't expect you to read it or, or follow it, but basically this, uh, this Vori, this fraternity, is, um, it, it emerged in the labor camps in the 1910-1920s, more or less. It's, um, it's got uh, strict rules, so it follows uh, a code, uh, as we said, uh, and uh, Pagnatia means to a system of collective beliefs. Pagnatia is like a codes, an understanding that they have. So they have rules, they have courts. So if you uh, disobey or if you don't follow the rules, the, the, the law, you get punished. So I remember studying a case of a war or somebody who was punished in the Far East, in Magadan, in, in the Far East of Russia, and he was punished by a court. So the authorities moved this guy to Ukraine in the 1950s. And still after three years, the guy was killed. So the ability of this fraternity to pass a sentence and kill, I mean, and, and, and execute the sentence is quite extraordinary across prisons. So it's not just a gang in one prison. It's a, it's a criminal fraternity that spans the entire Soviet system, especially the prison system in the, in the Soviet period. They also had gathering, so they had meetings in which they discussed matters of common interest, uh, um, and also uh, in these meetings, people would be admitted into the new fraternity, the rules would be recited. A lot of the, of the rules and of the behavior of the fraternity resembles the Russian Orthodox Church ritual. So they borrowed a lot of the ritual from the church, like the Sicilian mafia did with the Sicilian, with the Catholic Church. They have a language of their own. So they speak a sort of a jargon of their own. And what is also fa fascinating for me is that once they enter the fraternity, like they enter the, they go through the ritual, they are given a nickname, a new name in effect. So not just a nickname. So we, by nickname, understand, you know, Federico, the guy with glasses, right? That would be my nickname. But they are given in effect what is a new name, exactly like you, it happens in the, in the church. 
and the Vori are the leader of the of a crime group. And so they subscribe to an ideology which is shared by other bosses. Is, there is no boss of the bosses. So there is not a single guy in charge of the whole thing. They all are equals, these bosses. Um, and during the Soviet Union, most of these people were in prison because, because it was a totalitarian and very authoritarian society. So it's very hard to commit crime outside prison. Now, the Vori, as we know them, still exist. And they're still uh, considered to be very dangerous. And in 2011, for instance, the Obama administration listed the Vori among the transnational organized crime groups that pose the greatest threat to American security, together with Los Zetas and MS-13 and the Camorra and the Yakuza. So they're still with us, the Vori, not just in the 90s. So I spent a lot of my time studying this fraternity, and I still study it now. Um, three minutes. Okay, so maybe I will uh, go fast because I don't want to spend too much time. These are the kind of people that I'm talking about. They have uh, tattoos. Uh, these are very elaborate tattoos of, of their body. Um, these are photos from prison, from prison cells in, in Greece. Um, this is a, obviously a very elaborate um, uh, tattoo from, uh, it says, uh, save and protect. And St. Nicholas is uh, the, the, the one of the most important saints in Russian Orthodox churches. They produce this kind of things. This was given to me, sent to me by email, uh, by, by mail, by some of them in prison in Greece. And also they have been part of the uh, of popular culture. This was a movie, Our Kind of Traitor, out of a novel by John Le Carré, which talks about the Vori in, in London. So I spent a lot of time studying these guys. Um, and I think I have to skip this because I think we don't have time. But most recently, I've written a, a paper on, on them again. Uh, and um, I study them uh, as of uh, now. Maybe I skip this because we don't have time. I just want to show you this. These are the data on the Vori today. Uh, so, they go, so these are the data we collected about the history of the fraternity from the 1920s to 2020. And as you can see, the, the death, this is a graph of the death of the Vori. The worst period of their life was actually during the transition to the market economy. That was the most dangerous time for the mafia. Even more dangerous than Stalinism, which was 1938, when quite a big number of them was killed. So, that number is around 80 people in 1930s. Uh, so you can imagine how many more, the hundreds were killed during the transition. Um, so I don't have time to go into this detail. If you want to ask me more questions, I have a lot of data on them that span the entire uh, century. We also did, um, uh, let, let me go faster. Um, the other interesting thing is that the Vori are not spread everywhere in the former Soviet Union. This is a map of Georgia, and it shows that the Vori are only in some parts of the uh, Republic of Georgia. So the other key point here is that mafias do not uh, exist absolutely everywhere in a given context. So in this, in this shows that uh, most of the Vori in the Republic of Georgia today they are, of course, in the capital, Tbilisi, Kutaisi, but also in these strange parts, Batumi, Sukumi, so these very strange, um, for reasons that have to be explained. Is it coming to an end? So I think I should really uh, stop here. Um, I think I should conclude. Um, I wanted to say that after this work on the Vori, I wrote a second book on uh, how mafias move from one place to another. Then I wrote a third book about similarities between different mafias. Um, but ultimately, I would probably want to say that the study of mafias is relevant both at a practical level, because obviously these people spread and exist in several countries, but also at the theoretical level, because they really tell us something very important about the, uh, the way society works. On this note, uh, I hope I haven't taken too much time. I'm still um, in time, and I end it here. You are on, in time. Thank Good. you very much, you Professor Baresia. Um, tenim 10 minutes per formular preguntes. 
fins a les 11, em diuen. M'he de culpar. Tenim 5 minuts, doncs. Vale, són les 10, veritat. Tu has a lot més temps. Ah, ok. Disculpeu, soc jo que no estic in time. Tenim molts temps, gràcies. Endavant, endavant, em sap molt de greu. Sorry, just to say if this... Anyone should, so far, any question? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to interrupt. No, no, it's the, great. The it's, I think that it's so interesting that I, I thought that many people wanted to have yeah, 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 questions. Absolutely. My apologies for the interruption. But, but because the matter is that you have more time to talk. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. <laughs> may, maybe you have at least 20. 25 minutes uh, for, for, for talking because we, we are completely on time. Ah, good, so, good. Sorry. Good. Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. No, I can answer questions, absolutely, yeah. And then I can, well, if, if we have time, we can, I have some more. Um, Maybe if you want to elaborate a little more about your presentation. No, I, I can, I saw there was a question. Please go ahead, yeah. Thank you very much. I will make my question in English, uh, uh, okay. in, in, in Catalan, and I trust that it will be translated into, into English. Um, sí, um, crec que uh, vaja, ha estat per mi molt interessant de aquesta, um, aquest model d'explicació de la delinqüència organitzada i concretament la, la de tipus... Time and mafia is based on trust based on trust. And that has led me to think in what we've seen, the data and the uh, survey of public safety in Catalonia, and could be interesting in this case, in all of the editions that we've had in the past years, we have observed that there is a lack of uh, denunciations, uh, uh, in the last one, only 26% of cases where people don't denounce because they have a lack of trust. They don't trust the police, they don't trust the institution, and they don't trust the fact that the police could do something to resolve their problem. And so we have seen there is a decrease in this. And in with a sensation that we have a feeling with respect to the capability of the institutions to solve uh, problems such as occupying houses, incompetence uh, of organizations and politicians. This is an example. So it's a, a symbolic example of a situation and it generates lack of trust. And that means that there are other initiatives to solve the problems of people who are asking for security, asking for protection in other methods, with other methods. So the question is that with these situations, there is no mafia or it has not grown too much, this ma mafia type of phenomena. We have not imported a Russian mafia, for example. I don't know if this is just a matter of time, if that will happen, or what are some of the barriers that would uh, prevent this from happening? On the other hand, uh, so the uh, uh, mafia organization may be, uh, find it too expensive, or the risk of being detained, of being put in prison is quite high, and maybe they don't. That, I, I was thinking this with your intervention. it is extremely important that there is trust in institutions. Uh, trust in institutions, uh, for me, it's related to um, somewhat uh, extra legal governance. So the extent to which people 
do not trust in institutions, it gives a possibility for other entities to become those regulators or those protectors or those, in effect, policemen or police officers. It doesn't have to be a mafia, and mafias do not exist everywhere. They are very special organizations, as you pointed out. They are very hard to create, and they are also very hard to expand. I mean, Gambetta said they never expand. I think it's, they expand under certain conditions, but they are very hard to create. However, there could be other entities that uh, some are benign and positive, could be a community leader, could be a, a church, of course. But on the other end, sometimes they are not. So in, in England, where I live in the United Kingdom, we have a lot of communities. Imagine this, there are communities in the United Kingdom that never report a crime, not one. There are pockets of communities that just never report a crime. So either they live in paradise <laughs> or somebody else is solving the crime. And what you have in, in the United Kingdom is not the Russian mafia or the Sicilian mafia, but you have gangs, you have uh, um, uh, organizations that are not just youth gangs. They are very serious gangs, very serious, usually dealing in drugs, that also solve community problems. So one of my research recently is on London, and we did a survey of the entire city of London and we separate gangs that are purely um, involved in drugs uh, from those who also are involved in community activities. So you have gangs in London that are involved in uh, uh, charities, that youth clubs. Uh, in Milan, of course, you have seen there are gangs now from Latin America that are very violent. So I think uh, lack in, in trust in institution is very serious, especially for immigrant communities that are not integrated. So I'm not saying mafia is going to be necessarily the only answer, but there could be a negative, non-benign answer to uh, the problem that uh, I think it's a big political problem. It's a big political issue for societies and government. And so to in and not only trust in the police, as you mentioned, but also trust in courts, uh, access to social services, um, and imagine in a society where you have a large immigrant community which is uh, undocumented, they cannot go by definition to, to the state, right? So they are a typical at risk of being then prey to other entities. So I think this work, uh, although it sounds very theoretical at some level, trust, and it actually has got very specific um, applications and and, uh, and issues. So if I still have 10 minutes, uh, yeah. yeah, until so 10, you have 20 minutes, in fact. including questions though. No, no, out of questions. Out of questions. So I, I think uh, the, the issue that you raised actually um, um, speaks to my next uh, set of slides, um, which is, uh, uh, so, so basically, uh, I think we can move on from the Vori, but basically I think the Vori are a, a mafia as, uh, as uh, we define it. Uh, and also they are a mafia that has adapted very well to the post-Soviet period uh, because they still exist. So this criminal fraternity, although you could see many people died in the 90s, uh, they were also able to survive. And what is extraordinary about the, the Vori as well as the Sicilian Mafia, is that they are institutions that have survived for over a century. The Sicilian Mafia, in fact, almost two centuries. Not many institutions <laughs> have survived two centuries, right? How many businesses uh, from 200 years ago are still around? Not many. Um, some universities are still around, but you know, there are not that many. Uh, so these are extremely resilient organizations uh, organized in a way which is very efficient and effective. And it's the organization is that you have uh, bosses on the ground which control the territory who then coordinate across each other in a very different, in a very vast territory without having a boss of the bosses. Um, so anyway, the Voria are still there. They changed the rules after the end of the Soviet Union. 
uh, they even changed the way they name each other. And also they moved out of prison and they control now market uh, section of the market. Um, this is a, again a photo of the guy I knew during a, 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 a birthday party, which I attended and he was making new, uh, new worry and now he died. <laughs> so the guy I interviewed, the local boss died and this is his, uh, his burial uh, in the city of Perm. And it actually is very expensive to do this sort of um, uh, monuments. Uh, so this is his, um, he, the way he's buried, where he's buried in the cemetery of Perm. And the typical sort of the way this works is that you are meant to sit there when there is no snow and you can then drink a, a glass of vodka to his memory. And there is a little glass waiting for, for you. So it's a way to pay respect to, uh, to him. So there is a combination of traditional and new type of um, monuments for these kind of people. So these people are buried in major churches in Russia, and also they are buried with the church blessing. Um, now, I wanted to come to the point that you were just making, which is the topic of my next book. Um, so do mafias move, you know, to, so obviously you, you were saying, you know, is there a Russian mafia in Catalonia? Obviously not. Um, it is not as big as, I mean, I suspect there isn't. Um, and the question that I was asking in my second book is uh, th this one. If uh, mafias are a product of the transition to the market economy, like I was studying for my PhD, how come they emerge in a territory where there is no uh, new market economy, such as Northern Italy? Um, and also, Gambetta's argument is that mafias are so connected to the territory, they're like a mine. Uh, so according to him, they can never move. And yet, of course, uh, if you are Italian, you know that the biggest uh, story about the mafia in Italy now, since the 1970s to now, is that the mafias have moved to the north. So the big story in Italy is that the Andrangheta especially, and also to some extent the Sicilian mafia, but especially the Andrangheta has gone from Calabria to Piedmont, to Lombardy, to the Veneto region, and to Emilia Romagna, which is my region of origin. So obviously there was something strange in Gambetta's argument that mafias never move because they do move. Uh, it may not be easy, uh, but they do move. And so I wanted to ask in my next book, uh, under which conditions do they move? And under which condition they succeed in, in becoming entrenched in the new territory? And under which conditions they fail to do so? Um, so that's the second book. <laughs> uh, so in, in among other things, in this new book, uh, I study... Uh, a particular uh, mafia group uh, from uh, uh, Gioiosa Ionica, which is in Calabria, it's called the Mazzaferro clan, uh, which uh, around the same time in the 1950s and 60s, uh, and then 70s, of course, uh, had members of the group, both in uh, Piedmont and in uh, Verona. So Piedmont is uh, the region next, where Turin is the capital and Verona is the Veneto region. And in, at that, in that particular story, a city of Bardonecchia is uh, a, a city which was the first one in Italy to be uh, disbanded for mafia penetration. So Bardonecchia is a town really far from the origins of the Andrangheta, which uh, the government of Italy shut down the local political process because the mafia had taken over the political process. So the city council was disbanded by the Minister of Interior of uh, Internal Affairs. Uh, at the same time, the Mazzaferro clan had an outpost in Verona in the 1960s and 70s. Now that for me was a really interesting research design because the, here you have the same mafia of origin trying to move in two different places roughly at the same time and of course, uh, although they are very different, uh, still Northern Italy is also pretty similar in terms of trust, in terms of, um, in terms of um, corruption, culture. So for me, it was almost like a natural experiment, an experiment in which you can test 
why in one case, which was the case of Bardonecchia, the mafia was very successful, and why in the case of uh, uh, Verona, it failed to become entrenched, and after a few years, they, they left. Um, incidentally, the Mazzaferro clan uh, in, in Piedmont is responsible for the murder of the chief prosecutor of Turin, one of the biggest uh, mafia murders in, in Italy. So the chief prosecutor of the city of Turin was murdered by this guy, extremely dangerous people. Um, so what I did uh, was, I mean, obviously I don't have time to, although I have a lot of time, not that much. Uh, I, I studied the, 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 the building uh, licenses and the, mainly the, the, um, the construction market of Bardonecchia. So what happened in the 1960s and 70s, there was a massive boom in construction in Bardonecchia. Uh, so the story of Bardonecchia, I don't know if I have the photo of the guy here, but the story of Bardonecchia is that in the 1950s, a very major boss called Roccolo Presti was forced to move to Bardonecchia by a state uh, um, sentence. So it was called Soggiorno Brigato. So Italy had this very crazy policy that if you belong to the mafia, uh, but there was not enough proof to put you in jail, you would be subject to an order to move out of your territory. So facilitating obviously the spread of the organization. It's called Soggiorno Brigato in Italian, um, forced resettlement in English. So this guy was subject to that and uh, he chose to go to Bardonecchia. But he arrives in Bardonecchia and not much goes on. It's a tiny city in, uh, you know, there is some skiing, but there was not much going on. After he arrived in, for reasons completely independent of his, there was a massive transformation in the local economy. Uh, people from Turin and Milan started to buy and build new homes in, to go skiing. So this is the graph of the new uh, licenses that were um, granted. So a massive increase in the local, uh, in the local uh, economy. So what happened was that the local entrepreneurs, the constructors in the local economy, did not have enough people to work in the new um, market. And this guy, this boss from the Andrangheta, who happened to be there for other reasons, because he was sent there by the police, uh, by the state, organized a informal market, informal um, a market of workers. So uh, he organized the people who worked on this um, uh, cantieri. You know, there were people working on the construction of the new homes. So he was organizing a labor racket, labor racketeering, and he controlled them and forced them to not to sign up to trade unions, so not to use the state type of protection. Uh, and that was very favorable to the local entrepreneurs because they had a very docile working force. So you had this combination of a massive increase in the economy, uh, a guy who is able to organize labor racketeering, the workers are forced to work uh, in very bad conditions. And yet, of course, they get a job because there was a lot of migration to the north of Italy and people were unemployed. So they were somewhat happy to work there. The other thing that the mafioso did was to reduce competition from outside. So if you were a construction company wanting to build in Bardonecchia, uh, you would be prevented by violence. So people would be killed. There was a couple of murders. So I hope it's clear what's going on. And this is the local conditions that give rise to a mafia. You have somebody who just happens to be there. You have a massive transformation in the local economy. And this guy is able to give a service to the entrepreneurs, the builders of the local economy, which is a docile working force, which is happy to work there. And he also controls the market and reduces competition. And that was the combination of factors that allowed the local mafia to become entrenched uh, to the point that one of the local builders become the mayor of the city. He works very closely with the boss. 
And eventually both of them go to jail because eventually the, the state after 10, 15 years arrests them all and uh, disbands the city council. So these uh, are for me the conditions that are still local, but allow a mafia from the outside to emerge. Um, so you have, uh, again, lack of uh, um, use of the state. You have um, interest of local entrepreneurs. So you have an alliance between economy and mafia, ultimately, in this city. And the local economy benefits greatly from the existence of the mafia. So it's not that the mafia forces itself on the entrepreneurs. No, they want the mafia because it provides them workers that are going to... Um... Anyway, this was the second book I wrote, which is called Mafias on the Move, <laughs> which also comes with a nice uh, quote from, uh, from John Le Carré, a compelling read. And the book is all organized in that way. So I've got mm, two cases of the same mafia trying to become entrenched in a new territory. In one case, they succeed, and in another, they fail. So I differ from uh, the original Gambetta argument very much there, because I'm saying that mafia do move and can become entrenched, but in some sense, agreeing with Gambetta, it's also not easy, and sometimes they fail. So not everywhere they try, they succeed. Um, now, I wrote the third book, which, um, so this is, I think, what are the general conditions for a mafia to emerge? Rapid spread of property, uh, increase in assets and the number of property owners. There is disputes among property owners and also bandits. The state cannot guarantee protection. Uh, a supply of people trained in the use of violence who are unemployed and ready to take up the opportunity. And when they specialize, they become autonomous and, and mafia is set uh, to emerge. Oh, and by mafia here, I mean mafia in a broad sense of the word, not necessarily traditional mafias, but mafias that can be new mafias. Hence, for me, the word mafia becomes a general concept that can be applied also to non-traditional mafias, i.e. the Yakuza, the Hong Kong triads, the Sicilians, the Russians, and the Americans, the Italian Americans. So these, I think, are general conditions that uh, give rise to organizations that look very much like, uh, like a mafia. Um, uh, and so this is how mafias emerge in different countries. In the case of, um, of uh, say, uh, Sicily or Japan or Russia, what the mafia was doing was provide protection of property rights in uh, land, uh, water, and legal products. In the case of Hong Kong, the mafia emerged by providing protection or control over the labor market, and these are the Hong Kong triads. And in the case of the United States, the mafia emerged at the time of prohibition. At the time of prohibition, you have, again, a massive market, a massive transformation in the local economy. People want to buy and sell booze, i.e. Uh, alcohol, uh, but they cannot uh, go to court if people don't follow the rules. And so they use the, the Italian-American mafia, which, thanks to prohibition, becomes really important. So this, I think, is how mafias emerge in general. They emerge over the protection of property rights over either legal or illegal commodities um, and massive transformation in the local economy often give rise to these uh, uh, organizations. Now, it could be the transition to the market in Russia, a massive phenomenon, or it could be the little Bardonecchia context, but for the local context, it's huge. <laughs> And, and of course, prohibition, which is a topic I'm very interested in, I, I wrote about in that book, uh, the prohibition of alcohol gave rise to, um, to the Italian-American mafia as a national organization in the US. Of course, they existed before, but they were not involved in major uh, protection racketeering. Uh, they were doing some, as you know, la mano nera, or they were doing some uh, stealing horses and cars. So really, Petty, petty crime. Are you still with me? Do I still have five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
So the, the final book I wrote, uh, and here I will going to end, I promise, is a third book called Mafia Life, which is what you have there. Uh, so the, the question then, which is the final issue I wanted to talk to you about, is that if you sort of believe everything I told you so far, um, the final question that I ask myself is, are the traditional mafias a product only of their territory? Uh, are they a cultural product? So obviously there is a huge debate of whether uh, the Sicilian mafia emerged in Sicily because there is some sort of Sicilian culture that makes Sicilians more likely to be mafiosi. Uh, it's a very strong argument in Italy, for instance. Uh, it's a very strong argument also used by political parties that think uh, the, the North is better than the South, and uh, such as the Northern League. And so a question I was asking myself in my third book is precisely this one. And my short answer is no. Uh, I think what I was trying to show, and I keep showing in this new book, is that actually mafias are virtually identical across time and space. So the, the five mafias I study in this book, Cosa Nostra, Yakuza, Trias, the Russian mafia, and the Italian American mafia, are surprisingly similar to each other, incredibly similar. They have virtually identical rules. So if you look, which I did, looked at the rules at the ritual, when you join the mafia, you are told what rules, the zakon, you know, the law you have to follow. They are virtually identical. So you become a member of the Yakuza and the rules they tell you when you join is the same as you are told in Sicily. You know, do not sleep with the wife of somebody in the organization. Do not talk to the police. Do not um, cheat, you know, the, obey the rules. They are virtually identical, uh, almost identical. And also the organizational structure is very similar. As I was trying to say earlier, these are not organizations with a boss that controls the entire organization because it's virtually impossible to do so. There are localized groups with a boss. So the Bardonecchia boss or the, the, the Marinella boss in Calabria. And then the bosses join an organization and they speak to each other. So they coordinate. Uh, so in a sense, the, the Russian mafia is the all the bosses when they gather together and talk, or the Sicilian mafia is the same. Um, also, they penetrate very similar markets, all these mafias, they all penetrate construction, uh, biz local businesses, uh, shops that sell, that are fixed. Um, also, what is fascinating, and it's a issue to be still, I think, resolved, I don't have a real answer for that. These traditional mafias exclude women, so women are never admitted into this organization, which is really a puzzle because uh, things have changed so much in terms of women's participation in the labor force, in crime, and yet the traditional mafias still exclude women from, from joining. Of course, the gangs that I was talking about in, in London, for instance, do not necessarily exclude women, but the traditional mafias do, and that is, um, we can discuss why. I, it's uh, So I... Um, as I said, the norms are pretty much the same. Uh, obey the boss, help each other, do not go after a woman's uh, member, like the wife of somebody else. So they've got very strong norms of sexual behavior. Do not inform the organization, do not talk to people you don't know. Uh, so ex there is one norm in the Sicilian mafia, which is quite peculiar which is do not protect uh, prostitution. You know, in theory, the Sicilian mafiosi should not get involved in prostitution. It's the only peculiar norm. Everything else are identical. Um, so then I wrote a book, which is probably coming up now. It's called Mafia Life, which is the one you've got there, uh, which it's, uh, it's written in a more narrative style than my previous books and was translated in several languages, including Spanish. <laughs> Mafia life, right? Um, so I think I've told you all I wanted to tell you, really, and I think I've come now, really, I've come to the end of my talk. Um, and I suppose what I want to conclude on is that um, there are uh, these issues of trust and protection and governance. Now I have received a very large grant 
from the European Union, and it's called the NERC grant, which has allowed me to build a team in Oxford where we are studying issues to do with criminal governance around the world. And uh, we have a project on, uh, on cybercrime, which is something I've been working on, and we can talk about more if you want. We are trying to build a, a, a survey of cybercrime around the world so that we can map the countries where cybercrime is more prevalent as opposed to not. And believe it or not, such a, um, a database such a, does not exist. So we want to build a matrix of cybercrime around the world with the understanding that cybercrime is not normally distributed. So there are some hubs of cybercrime around the world, such as uh, Ukraine, such as uh, Russia, um, Vietnam, Brazil. So why is it some countries more prone to cybercrime than others? So that's one of the projects. Another project is on criminal governance in the UK. I was telling you about the gang project in both uh, London and, um, and Nottingham. And, and then we have uh, also continued to work on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the VORI, trying to gather more data uh, on them. Uh, and thirdly or fourthly, we have a project on transnational um, shipment of drugs. So one of my team members is actually now in Colombia uh, in Medellin uh, doing interviews and collecting evidence on how the transnational shipment of drugs works from uh, um, Latin America to Europe. And of course, the fascination of that particular topic is that it really speaks to the issue of trust, right? Why would you trust, uh, you know, you, you are supposed to pay money and so somebody may not pay in, in time, you ship the drugs, but then is the person going to pay you or not? How do you settle disputes if um, the person doesn't pay you or doesn't deliver the drugs? And, it, and I find it really fascinating because it speaks to uh, also what must have been happening in the middle, medieval times, right? During the medieval times, you also had the same problem. You had... Uh, producers of cloths in Florence selling cloths to London buyers, but there was no state uh, that you can turn to for uh, the solution of the problem if there was a problem. So how do you solve long distance trade in the absence of the state? So these are the, the four projects that we're working on, cybercrime, uh, criminal governance in non-traditional country like the UK, still the Russian mafia, and how they govern prisons and outside prisons and um, and how trade works across uh, long distance. So I speak. I think I've spoken a lot, and it's been great to uh, answer your question and to address you. And it's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Ara sí, no n'hem pas a les preguntes quan toca. No sé si hi ha alguna pregunta a la sala. First, to thank you for, it's very interesting. It's, I don't understand this very well, don't know this very well, but it's a fascinating view of how things work, how these gangs work. And I am too curious about two things. First, if you have studied what are the necessary elements to destabilize these groups in a definitive way, because they're very resilient. And if you have understood studied, what are the variables? And in second place, to know if once there is a disarticulation of a group or they are detained, what happened when they are in prison? Um, if you know what happens, how what happens when they are already arrested and in prison? What I'm curious about this. How do they survive? Um, thank you very much. Um, so yes, no, I thought a lot about how mafias end. Uh, so the, the, the end of the mafia and also mafias decline greatly. Apparently the Hong Kong triads has declined a lot in its ability to control. I think there are two two sets of variables. Some are uh, uh, unintentional. So they come from 
situations that are not meant to attack the mafia, but do in the end. So, for instance, globalization, the internet revolution, that has uh, taken away a lot of markets for the mafia. So imagine when I was young, I would go and buy, um, you know, buy plane tickets in a, in a local travel agency. Now it's moved online. Now it's very hard for a local mafia, like the Syrian mafia, to go online, to extort um, uh, shopping online. So I think globalization, technological innovation can have an effect uh, and reduce the ability of the mafias to operate. So this is one factor. Uh, the second factor, of course, is intentional policies to reduce the power of the mafia. And I think uh, the most important ones are not just policing. So obviously, we are all very happy when these bosses are arrested, you know, and they should be arrested. But if you take the case of Sicily, uh, we had uh, massive trials, like the maxi trials arrested 500 people, 500 people. All the bosses of the Sicilian mafia are in jail except one. Uh, and yet the Sicilian mafia is still there. So clearly, policing and repression, which is very important, is not the only answer. The only answer, I think, goes back to the point of trust uh, in institutions and trust in the community. And so one of the projects that is that I study in the UK is the police uh, engagement with community and try to convince communities to trust the state and not to trust uh, the, the gang. Because for me, what is really interesting is not so much the gang uh, sells drugs, you know, that, I mean, it's not my interest. But what I find extremely dangerous is the moment that a normal person uh, turns to the gang leader when he has a problem with the neighbor or the, the daughter or the son or the cousins, uh, a problem with the rent. Uh, this is when the community becomes uh, part of the, of the criminal world. And so that is what I think police and authorities should really worry about. Um, I read recently an investigation in the Sicilian mafia case uh, 2019, 2020, about, these are the time when the events occurred, at the time of COVID, in fact. And there are extraordinary stories of the local business people who would turn to the mafia boss to solve issues to do with rent. So a guy is not paying rent, and instead of going to the court, uh, uh, they go to the boss that makes the rent being paid. So that, to me, is how you um, you solve the problem. And the moment you have an increase in trust uh, by the community in the institutions, you take away the role of the mafia uh, in the community. Now, of course, uh, that doesn't solve the problem of drugs <laughs> because that's a different question that I don't study incidentally. But obviously, if you have a huge market and a huge demand for drugs and marijuana, it's illegal. Uh, somebody will keep producing it. Um, so that, to me, is what would be necessary. Now, when they go to prison, uh, it depends. So the, the Russians are very used to go to prison. It's part of their culture. So they're actually quite happy, and they run prisons uh, a lot. Sicilians don't like to go to prison, so they try not to go. Uh, and uh, But they, uh, yeah, they continue to... So it, they continue to exist in prison, and they are extremely... So the, the, the dangerous thing is to put them together. So as you remember, there was a case in El Salvador, I think, when they put them all in the same prison. So the MS-13, which was this gang that came from Los Angeles, had started to spread in uh, Guatemala and El Salvador, and the government put all the members of the MS-13 in the same prison, which obviously was a bad idea because it allowed them to coordinate I think more generally, and again, it's something I don't particularly study, more generally, prison can help uh, the mafia because it, uh, uh, fi they find recruits, uh, people who are recruited from prison into the organization. So there is a lot of work on the negative effect of prison. Obviously, we cannot abolish prison. At least uh, I haven't thought about that very seriously. Some people think we can. But prison is a very dangerous place because it might turn... That's why you have to be very careful about putting somebody in prison, especially young people, um, because I think mafias thrive in prison. I mean, the Vori are in Italy, so there are Vori in Italy in prison, 
and in prison they elected a new boss of Italy. So there were elections. <laughs> and apparently some of these Vori in Italy refused to be released from prison because they wanted to vote in this election. So prisons is not uh, something that scares them. It's part of their, um, of their job. It's, uh, and, uh, we, we would be very scared, but they find it uh, normal to be in prison. So it's not something I study directly, but it's a, a huge uh, problem. Thank you. Al, hi ha alguna altra pregunta? Sí. Bon dia. Eh, jo volia fer una... Yes. I wanted to ask a question with respect to the groups, the mafias that are hidden in the network. What we don't know about internet that uh, traffic with organs, with people, and all types of crimes. We've heard about, we've heard about these things, but do we have evidence that this is happening? Uh, and so these organizations that you can't visualize because they are working, in a space that that is not tangible how can we do how how can we work with all of this how can we work with these organizations that exist in the internet thank you very much um this is a really interesting phenomenon that really i find extremely fascinating and also extremely dangerous uh, and and terrible um so I, I study um, cybercrime a little, and especially one of my students wrote a very good book about it called um, The Industry of Anonymity, published by Harvard University Press. And the book is, is the author is called Jonathan Lustau. So that's a great book to read. Um, but my view, which is um, a bit uh, strange, <laughs> probably, is that um, they are hidden only to some extent. So there are countries which harbor more cyber crime than others. So I went to Romania, for instance. Romania is considered to be a hub of cyber crime in Europe. Uh, so I went to a little town called Ramniko Vulcha, which is meant to be the center of cyber crime in, uh, in, uh, in, in Romania. And when you go there, you look at the local police, which is very corrupt. Uh, the local politician, which is also was in jail at some point, the mayor was arrested. And so the reason why this particular town became so important is because there were factors outside the internet that allowed the, the gang to thrive. And the gang in this city was mainly involved in frauds on the internet. So they would sell fake holidays to Spain, for instance, so there are factors that are outside the net, the internet, that explain why certain countries have more cyber crime than others. And that's this project I want to do on uh, having a, a survey and of experts that tell us which kind of um, type of cyber crime are more common in a certain country. So for instance, Russia is a country where there's a lot of cyber crime. Uh, uh, there was a, um, you know, Gozi is one of the most important viruses ever developed by my, a man called Kuzmin, and he developed in Russia because Russia allows it to operate freely uh, as long as they attack outside uh, targets. So, uh, yes, it's hard to catch these people, but... Uh, they exist also offline. That's my idea, that these people exist also outside the internet. These are real people. They are humans behind the computer. And they are not everywhere. Now, of course, they could be in any country, but some countries have much more th than others. So that's the first point I want to make, that there are offline dimension of cybercrime. Um, the second point I want to make is that um, there are two strategies to fight cybercrime on the net. 
One is to shut down the, the site. So if you uh, remember Silk Road, Silk Road was this site uh, where people would uh, buy and sell all kinds of things, including pornography, drugs, guns. And what the US did, the US uh, police, uh, the FBI, they just shut it down. So if you go, go to the site of Silk Road, it says this is a crime scene. The police the do not enter, this is a crime scene. Now, that is uh, what happened after that. The Silk Road was simply reproduced somewhere else. And so actually a couple of other sites very similar to Silk Road emerged. Um, so yes, great to shut them down, but it didn't really solve the problem. So with some colleagues, we are thinking about other strategies to tackle uh, this. Also, Silk Road was based in the United States, uh, but if the site is based in Russia, the United States cannot go to Russia and shut it down. So Russia has got the highest number of sites where you can buy and sell um, illegal goods. One is called Medusa, one is called Rampedusa, sorry, Rampedusa, after the Italian island. And, and you basically go there and it's like a Amazon of crime. So even if you want uh, uh, to shut it down, you can't because Russia will not allow you to do it. So what can you do? I mean, obviously not much, but one thing you can do, and it brings us back to the issue of trust. And it's a very practical story. You can try to inject doses of mistrust among the traders. So what these people do on the sites is to buy and sell, right? Exactly like offline. So what we are doing with this experiment, so we're doing an experiment now to check if this works. And the experiment involves, involves creating fake traders, fake traders that uh, uh, give false uh, uh, feedbacks to the trade. So they, uh, either give false feedbacks on what they buy or set themselves up as fake traders and do not deliver what they promise to deliver. I, I hope it makes some sense. These are two strategies that we are testing on in an experiment online to see whether this reduces the level of trade. And so we have done a, a pilot which has been published already in a journal called Global Crime and now we finally did the main, the main uh, um, experiment. And we actually do find that trade goes down when we use these two strategies uh, as an experimental setting. Does it make sense? Uh, so, that, so that's my thinking on that. Um, it's very hard to, to stop it completely uh, but the policy of simply shutting down the sites uh, doesn't really work for two reasons. One is because the sites often are in Russia or in China, uh, or but also uh, because they then even if they're not, they simply regroup. So my view is to go back to the issue of trust, that injecting doses of mistrust in the trade actually reduces the trade. So I think it's a smart policy. Which, is, which could be adopted by the police. It's not going to uh, shut down the trade, but it makes it harder. Bé, volia fer alguna pregunta, formular alguna pregunta eh, de les que s'han deixat via streaming. Laura Vera, eh, si formula... Any further question, uh, would you... The mafia created when the state is failing. Yes. For example, offering security, employment, housing, and even rubbish collection. If this is the case, nowadays with the crisis in Europe, how can be prevented? Uh, what do you think should do the state or governments? So could you tell me the beginning again? Uh, she said, yeah. Is the mafia created? when the state, is a mafia created when the state is failing? For example, offering a security, yeah, yeah. employment? So basically I think so. You know, if I had to, if you put a gun to my head and tell, do you agree or not? I basically agree. I think there is a, a relationship between state failure and the mafia. 
Now, not every state failure leads to the mafia. So there may be state failures and no mafias, but I think state failures is a condition for the mafia to exist. Now, the failure can be of different kinds, and sometimes the failure is inevitable because uh, there are some commodities that inevitably are illegal. So you cannot legalize um, pedophiles, you cannot legalize uh, uh, exploitation. So there are some areas where the state, by definition, has to keep some commodities legal. But the, the worrying problem is that also there are legal markets where the state fails. And I think that opens up the possibility for mafia or mafia-like organizations to enter. And as in the case of Bardonecchia, to have an alliance between legal businesses and the mafia. So yeah, the short answer is I basically agree. I mean, it, it would require some elaboration, but I don't think that's incorrect. Israel uh, ask also, why did you choose uh, Perm and not another city of Russia? Why not Moscow uh, in the not Sebo district? And not a uh, salt in Sebo district. She, she wrote that. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Uh, and when you do field work, you always have to think, where do I go and do it? You know, where, which uh, site I choose? And that's a major decision for people who do ethnography. And so in my case, I wanted to choose a place which was in Russia, of course, which did not have a major ethnic minority like uh, Tajikistan, Tajiks, uh, or, because obviously I couldn't possibly penetrate that. So Perm is basically a Russian city, like the ethnic Russian for 90%. Uh, it's a city where there was kind of thriving market economy. So there was, um, it was, it's a rich city. It's a very rich city. Um, and then uh, the, the, the one of the additional reason is that there was an exchange program between Perm and Oxford when I was a student. So there was a lot of people from Oxford who had been there. And so it was seemed to be a bit safer because there were uh, people that had been there before. I didn't choose Moscow because I thought Moscow was more studied as a city as opposed to the outside of Moscow. Um, although not in the mafia in particular, but Moscow is just too much uh, on the spotlight. And I wanted to study something outside um, the capital. Um, but yeah, the main reason was that I thought uh, it was uh, Rush ethnic Russians and there was a market economy. Uh, that was the main reason. Um... Okay, um, thank you. Adria Torramorell in Catalan. <laughs> <laughs> Diu que no és el tema en qüestió, però li agradaria saber eh, si la màfia es pot relacionar amb... He says this is not the question, but he would like to know whether mafia can be related to prohibited things such as drugs. But one of these organizations, like Antonio Correctado mentioned, could this theoretically mean that these mafias would no longer belong to these organizations in this case? I think that what he's trying to say is that if mafias, that's the way I interpret the question, I'm reading the questions literally, but my interpretation is that if we know that mafias participate in illegal activities such as drug trafficking, maybe if we, one way of preventing mafias from uh, doing these activities would be to decriminalize, for example, drug trafficking. Yes, sorry, I, I was very clear the question. I, yes, of course, th that's one solution. Um, and I think we should be very careful when we criminalize something. It's uh, a big decision to criminalize uh, the consumption of a particular good. So the, the decision to criminalize the, the sale and the transportation and the consumption of alcohol in the 1920s in, in the United States between 1920 and 1930, no doubt, no doubt made the Italian American mafia an international organization, certainly national level organization. 
the Italian American mafia from New York in particular. So we, and they did exactly what mafias do. They control the market in the sense they manage the market. They were involved in something called the curb exchange as in the stock exchange, but curb means the sidewalk. So they actually met uh, buyers and sellers in the back of um, bars in upper state New York and made sure that the products was produced uh, and delivered with good quality. So I think it's true when we legalize, we have to be very careful that we give rise or potential rise to either a lot of disorganized crime and violence, which also happened in 1930s, or a mafia that could take over that uh, control of the market. And I want to be very clear, what mafias do is not to produce the drugs or to, to, to produce the, the alcohol. The drugs are produced by the peasants in Colombia or the labs in Colombia um, or the the booze was produced in Europe or sometime in, in New York by ordinary Italians. Uh, so the mafia doesn't produce and doesn't even sell directly. It was done by traffickers. You know, I think uh, just to go back to the issue of organized crime, organized crime is a very vague concept, a very, very general concept. There are within that big concept at least three different functions. The production of the goods, uh, say drugs, so the peasants in Colombia, the transportation of the goods from Colombia to Italy, and it's done by traffickers. And then there is the protection, the governance of the market, which is done by mafia or mafia-like organizations. So that's what they do. And to go back to the question, yes, I think if you legalize, you take away an opportunity for the mafia to control that market. However, there is a limit to what you can legalize. You know, you might legalize marijuana, but should we legalize cocaine or methamphetamines or uh, heroin? We cannot legalize uh, uh, pedophiles. We cannot legalize... Um, so there are a lot of commodities, or we cannot legalize uh, fake medicines, you know, substandard medicine. So there is always something you cannot legalize. So legalization... Um, is also a matter for cultural, political debate, which goes beyond my expertise. But legalization can work in some cases. So personally, I'm totally in favor of legalizing marijuana, for instance, and I think it would help because it would reduce, uh, you know, time police spends on that particular. And I think marijuana has entered our culture. But that cannot work for everything. So yes, I think there is a, a role for legalization. And of course, marijuana has been legalized in the United States, in effect, right? Um, but uh, you cannot legalize everything. Uh, and um, so we have to understand that. So there is no easy fix. And that was Mark. Thank you, Professor Varese, for your presentation. I have a question which is here. Originally, I wanted to talk uh, you to explain more the project of uh, cybercrime, but because you have already addressed this topic, uh, I had another question, which is that suddenly in conferences, you start seeing more and more debate about, you know, northern criminology versus southern criminology. And I think that in organized crime, you have been one of the few that have tackled the issue of, you know, African organized crime which I think it's nothing serious to discard because we have been focusing on more or less the same crime groups all the time. But I do think that, for example, Nigeria organized, Nigerian organized crime is very, very important. And I think it's quite a, an, an issue going on mostly in Europe nowadays. Uh, so I wanted to ask you precisely that, a little bit about your research on uh, piracy in Somalia, because I think it's very, very innovative. It's not that you find this every day in journals. And then also, how do you think that, you know, African organized crime is eventually becoming a bigger issue as time goes by? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I, uh, I'm actually quite interested in Nigerian organized crime, uh, personally, uh, basically for a personal reason, because uh, the town I come from in Italy, it's called Ferrara, has had a huge uh, trial recently on um, Nigerian organized crime. So one of these so-called cult 
basically controlled the drug distribution in, in the city. And uh, the, the guy who was tried is actually, or was uh, at the time, the representative of the entire um, west and northern, west, northwest part of Italy. So he had been appointed to control Veneto or the other, or Emilia Romagna. And he was based in my hometown, which is a tiny little place in Emilia Romagna. So the trial is really fascinating. And um, again, one of the things that emerges from the trial is that this person next to the use of machetes and the violence, uh, they were of course fighting for territory, exactly like a market would do, control of the market, the territory. And they were also um, involved in community management. So they would ex they started to extort people in the community who had who were not in in drugs. So there was a case of a lady who was selling food at a shop, and she had to pay protection money to this guy. So I find it very interesting the ability to uh, to go beyond the market of Nigerian organized crime. So I think that's a really fascinating area to research. Um, so I've got all the material and I wanna, in the moment I have time and I'm afraid uh, I'm head of department now, so I don't have as much time as I should, but um, it's a great uh, topic to study. And again, without any sort of racist undertone, which is also very common in Italy against um, um, Nigerian organized crime, uh, they are very similar to other type of crime. And uh, the, the solution in the city by the local council was again to simply um, move in effect or, or police very much the, the railway station where they were selling and they simply move somewhere else, somewhere else in the city as, as cybercrime would. So again, the issue of policing did not solve the problem. Um, also, it's very interesting how they, it connects to illegal immigration and a lot of these Nigerians who worked in the gang had been in this huge uh, detention center in Sicily. So these are people who came from Africa, landed in Italy in this detention center in Sicily, and were not all criminal at all, but were beaten up by the cult in the detention center and then forced to work for the gang in, in my hometown. So I think there is an issue of how so you handle migration, which connects to Nigerian organized crime. Uh, yeah, thank you for your reference to my papers on uh, on Somali piracy, which I co-authored with Anya Shortrand, who is the person we were talking earlier about, who works on ransomware and, and, and kidnapping for ransom. So what we did in those papers was again, trying to, to disentangle the, the phenomenon. As you know, for some years, there was a huge amount of uh, hijack, hijacking of ships outside the Somali coast by pirates. And again, it was organized crime, it was pirates. And when you look into it very carefully, it turns out that the people who hijack are very, very different from the people who um, on shore protect uh, the, the ship. So once the ship has been hijacked, it has to go to shore where people have to be fed. You know, you have to feed the, the crew that you have hijacked. You have to keep the ship running and you have to negotiate the ransom with the ship owners. So it takes three four to four months on average. So the people who actually were running the operation, which I would call the protectors, were the local clans or the local in inverted commas, well, it's the wrong word, but I mean, the local clan were uh, paid protect money by the pirates. So there was a very clear distinction, a division of labor between those who steal the ship and hijack it and those who protect the operation. And then the third actors were actually investors from outside Somalia who would invest money into them. And so that also speaks to the fact that what we call a mafia uh, might be an unusual <laughs> entity, i.e. a local clan, but, and I'll, I'll end it here, but also what was fascinating for us is that not every 
clan in Somalia is involved in piracy. So if you look at the map of Somali hijacking of, uh, of ships, they are not uh, distributed across the entire coast. Not even, uh, as you know, Somalia was colonized by the British and the Italians, of course. And so there is no piracy in the area in so-called Somaliland in the very top of the country, which is a former British colony. But even in the part that was colonized by Italians, um, so um, piracy was only in a couple of spots. So not all clans were involved in, uh, in piracy. Moreover, some clans were involved and stopped being involved. So they started being involved and they stopped being involved, which speaks to the issue of how do you get rid of a mafia? You cannot just kill the clan because these are the local governance of the population. The clan is the organizing entity of the people, but sometimes they decide to be involved in crime, but sometimes they decide not to be involved in crime. So we have to understand under which conditions they might switch from being involved in crime to not being involved in crime. So the papers explore that and show that under certain conditions, the clan was happy not to be protecting pirates and to engage in legal business. And so that I think was very an important to policy um, argument. Uh, but I totally agree with you. I think we should be uh, studying, if possible, uh, issues that refers to so-called thousand and criminology and, um, and cast our net wide. Thank you. Crec que ara, ara ja sí, però crec que ja estem en temps, però si us plau, assistiu-me. Um... Thank you. I think it is now time, really. I think that would be it. Thank you very much, Professor Varese, for your presentation that we interrupted. Thank you very much for being here to reply to the questions that have been asked in a detailed and concise way. Thank you very much for being here with us today. And now we have a pause until 11.30. Thank you, Penelope. Until 11.30, we will be back here then with a round table. Thank you. Tant les persones que esteu a la sala com els que ens esteu seguint, anem a donar uh, continuïtat a la segona part de la jornada. Through Zoom, as we can see in the program, what we're going to do now is a round table on organized crime from different perspectives. We said in the beginning when we were presenting the sessions that traditionally these sessions on criminology organized by the Center for Legal Studies and the Open University of Catalonia combine practical and theoretical inputs. We've seen, we've heard today a very impressive academic uh, presentation on the first half of the morning. We now are moving to the more practical sphere. In this second part of the session, we wanted to give a political angle to the debate and also to discuss the question from different professional uh, perspectives, different professional roles which are connected that have uh, an impact uh, on each other, but each of these roles uh, are different and have their own specificities. In this round table, we have four speakers. They are all experts in the three fields that we thought that would be um, in interesting to choose. Public opinion through the media, uh, uh, the penitentiary sphere and the police sphere. We have with us very expert speakers. I'm going to introduce them and then they will have the floor. And when we finish their interventions, there will be another Q&A session. First of all, I wanted to introduce Joan Pere Caral Domenac. Uh, the reference is that he is a journalist and a writer. He is many more things. He has interviewed a lot of very relevant people. He's also a photographer. He has received relevant awards as well. So this is a person, a multifaceted professional 
with uh, great knowledge on the South American continent, one of his small relevant works was the involvement of the United States in the coup d'etat in Chile was covered by the European press. And he has published in the Revista de Occidente, El Periódico de Catalunya, La Bui, La Republica, and many other newspapers. At the end of the 80s, he started a process of research on mafias and he focused his uh, work as a journalist on this field. And I was going to say, I was, he has published numerous books on mafias and Sicilian mafia and many others in January this year, he presented one of these books, Mafia Economics and Policy, Economic Legality in the Era of Globalization. And to me, the title of the interview presenting this book was fascinating, saying something like, uh, mafia men are more like businessmen than uh, criminals. From uh, the point of view of the penitentiary sphere, we have with us Diego Vázquez. Diego Enrique Vázquez, who is head of internal prison systems area. He he's also um, has a degree in criminology by the University of Barcelona and also by SADE. He is responsible for the management program of EADA and he has held many uh, senior director positions in the Catalan penitentiary system. Cuatro um, Camins, he's also been in charge of social services of the Territorial Commission of Social Assistance Services in Barcelona. So it's a person with a lot of experience on uh, the penitentiary level and an expert with relevant uh, experience in this field. We also have Carlos España Morquecho with a degree in law at the University of Madrid and criminology by the University of Barcelona. He also has a title as, uh, on administration management by the University of Barcelona and has been has held many senior director positions in penitentiary centers. He was, for example, subdirectorate of the men prison centers, also Brian's dos and director of Brian's too. So these are two people that know in detail the Catalan penitentiary system and the way it works and how we'll make a very uh, interesting contribution. We also, and they both work Use, uh, on a regular basis with the Center for Legal Studies. We also have Luis Moreno Comendador, who is head of the Human Trafficking Central Prosecution Unit, Criminal Investigation Division of the Catalan Autonomous Police Force. He has a degree on criminology by the University of Barcelona. He has been uh, a member of Mossos de Squad uh, since mm, the 80s. Therefore, he has a very long trajectory in this organization and has worked in different central uh, research units with uh, illegal substances, terrorism, vehicle trafficking. As he is now head of human trafficking uh, and so has uh, a lot of experience on this field. And for sure, his contributions will be very interesting. And without further ado, we give the floor to Juan Caral. So they have given me the, uh, I've, I've never been good at improvising or speeches, so I'm going to stick to uh, my lines and my subject that I have been given. And I've been used to writing, not speaking. So I'm going to follow my, guideline, my script. So it's interesting to me, the concept of trust that Federico was mentioning, because uh, 
I based my presentation on the need of having an education or to know more about lack of trust. And so to try and think of something positive. Evidently, I'm talking about the lack of trust with respect to organized crime. I think that one of the subjects, one of the elements when talking about the efficacy of police actions or what favors mafias is a lack of understanding of trust or lack of trust. So the title was uh, to do an analysis. I, I'm going to talk about crime evidently, but the other side of the coin also, that is to say those elements that have a relation with the rest of us, with us, with our way of analyzing, dealing with and combating against this phenomenon and that are and coincide with some of the main conclusions that I have reached after years of observation. Crime or organized crime or the industry of illegality or informal economy is one of the emerging sectors of an economic system that is exhausted and that is in crisis everywhere. And that is why it constitutes a great challenge of society. But in contrast to the past, nowadays, there is another variable that is a challenge of contemporary society, which is submitted to many simultaneous crises. And I want to mention this because this is important and this has, a, we'll talk about it more further on. So the challenges of today cannot be seen through the look through the eyes of yesterday. We cannot become dinosaurs unable to see what is happening. We have to update language, methodology, the tools of work, the methods of coordination, how we train police. And also I would think we have to change our vision and our interpretation of certain elements. So, of course, this is hard. And the question is, are we doing this? Have we changed our vision? Have we changed our interpretation of organized crime? Sometimes I have the feeling that we, that this complex challenge, structural challenge that we have, which is transnational and that affects almost all countries and has ramifications on politics, on economics, on society, continues to be even today, a challenge that is postponed, relegated to the last part of the queue of uh, problems that have to be solved always because of political um, inaction or conflicts of interest or others or, or international legislation that is uh, sometimes deficient or contradictory. For me, it is very important to talk about the matter of silence, silence and opacity and the indifference of the majority that are around and form part of in, uh, the industry of organized crime. It's like a, a fog that uh, in, prevents us from be, seeing reality. In Italy, the judge Paolo Borsellino, he said, let's talk about 
uh, mafia. Let's talk about it on radio, on TV, in the newspapers, in Spain, in Catalonia. We don't talk about this. We don't talk about it and it's not explained. So they are governments, uh, the state are do not want to uh, accept the, the dimension of the problem or the politics. The majority of parties don't consider this a priority. It's not part of their political programs, of their campaigns, of their uh, legis law proposals, or to have a greater role in this respect, dealing with this. And I regret saying that there is, the organized crime is not a part of political debate. The efforts of our authorities to minimize the impact of crime are shared by the majority of nations. So normally you hide what you don't want to be seen. You hide, these are in, in Japan during decades, denied the importance of the Yakuza. And also in Germany did not uh, un, accept the the penetration of Andrage and different countries also minimize the uh, action of local uh, organized crime. The head prosecutor of Palermo, Mr. Cardinato, said that Spain does not have antibodies for Italian mafia or, or organized mafia, but I'm convinced that they were not debating about the effort of police. He was not referring to that. He was talking about another dimension of the conflict. He was talking about the confrontation of two cultures, anti-mafia and criminal, the cult culture of legality and the culture of illegality in Catalonia, in Spain, there has never been a cultural battle against illegality and even less against criminal activity understood as, as a, some commercial activity, as, as a entrepreneurial spirit. It's always been surprising to me that the country has had institutional campaigns to talk about climate issues, nutrition, health, sport and the benefits of sport, uh, sexual education, uh, energy consumption, the genders, uh, all of these things, but not have not done this about the values and benefits of legality in general and the dangers and the effects for society of illegal activity or criminal, organized criminal activity, as if this did not play a role or have an impact on citizens, as if it was something alien to our situation, to our reality, and more what happens in other countries. Um, on the other hand, I have always thought from the point of view of uh, living together, the treatment to, to go beyond the police and legal systems in order to be open to other parts of society, university, social action, finance, the world of education, the media. Why? because as economic uh, subject and in contexts like ours, criminality does no longer provoke social alarm. And this means that violence is invisible. It has a certain degree of indifference or even tolerance, passive or active tolerance. It's something that has to be dealt with by the legal system or by the police. 
And so the knowledge uh, and the information that we get is very superficial, very limited, only talking about arrests. And we would need, uh, everything is related to the information that the police give us. Apart from that, apart from the police and the legal system, the study of this phenomena is almost non-existent. There are no alternative channels of information, of opinion, of opinion, of debate. There are some few specific initiatives in the academic world, but normally we are indifferent and there are not so many analysis or, or statistics of specialized work um, about the true situation of the uh, criminal activity in different countries. Having said all of this, a great part of the uh, public opinion is still based on stereotypes from the fiction, from the movies. Um, it's something that is not connected to them or does not affect them. So with this silence and this lack of official education about criminal activity and about illegality in general has mean that we don't have the necessary conscience to identify the negative effects or of organized crime or the advance of this. We have to learn and to teach about to visualize criminality that surrounds us just as we know that for example with uh, forest fires there are motives there are reasons beyond um, so maybe you may think that i am exaggerating that that we are not in, in, in Italy or St. Petersburg and we don't need to have this methodology, um, uh, this, this vaccine. I would like to remind you of a significant fact. The generation of Italian judges that processed this and their heirs went to all of the schools of Sicily to talk about young people of the risks of mafia and illegality that was associated to this. And Bufalino, one of the great writers who said that the best way to uh, get rid of the mafias, conquer the mafias was with an army of young people. It's not something banal, it's, an issue for the future of millions of citizens who have to think about one of the more substantial contemporary dilemmas. Do we want to live in a world of illegality or do we want to have live in a world of legality? And here I would like to say once again, something that I say often because it defines what is the problem. Uh, the phrase of Calabrian writer Alvaro Corrado that says the worst desperation of a society is the doubt whether they are living uh, honestly or not. This is an old phrase that I think is still very current. Uh, and very adient in different territories. The undeniable fact that in many areas of the planet, illegality has become the only alternative for life for mi millions of people. And the, the last ways to rise up in society are linked to corruption and to illegal activities. The teaching that I'm talking about does not mean to identify certain citizens or clans or groups or whatever. I'm referring to knowledge that 
makes them aware of organized crime as an element that is parasitic and that weakens uh, the society and the economy and their rights are not recognized. It offers other channels to a passive regime, promotes submerged economy and the use of resources that criminality mafias never are never associated to common riches, common wealth. And it is the idea that we have to transmit a society that is feeding illegality cannot be sustainable on a long term basis. So illegal uh, the, the purchasing drugs um, uh, counterfeit uh, um, or falsified uh, products um, cannot help our uh, economic system. Our attitude vis-a-vis -vis, uh, legality is on the medium, long-term, a crucial election. We need to have an element of uh, uh, something that no, does not foster inequality. And as Claudio Magri says, the culture of indifference for the value of exchange as we have seen by in certain uh, uh, fiction works or uh, legal sentences or the consequences of certain judgments. There is one case that has all of the different aspects that I have talked about. It is something close to us, practical, and something that is useful for learning. I would like to finish with the analysis of this situation. As a summary, I would like to talk about a practical case, a current case that affects us directly and that talks about the majority of things that we've talked about, an incidence, an affectation that is becoming more and more important in the 21st century, that is uh, like a chain of events, of crisis events. If we analyze marijuana that has change the dynamic of drug trafficking in our territory, we will see that, yes, they are present and they all of the elements that we have mentioned are repeated. A context of economic crisis that contributes for the creation of social conditions. Uh, crime as another opportunity for progressing economically. Institutional opacity that wants to make this problem seem invisible. Contrast between the, the legal and police. Conscience, conscience of the criminal risk and its affectations in safety that is seen as something long term. And also with the permissibility of the society for the consumption of marijuana and a offer of services and logistic uh, services, the cultivation and commerce of marijuana that has begun undoubtedly has found with all of these factors a very effective uh, nutrient to develop. Let me say that the existence 
of uh, an education about the benefits of the legally. Well, you have seen that I always try to link illegality, law legality, and organized crime, because I think they are inseparable. Experience has shown to me, and I was talking also, this was mentioned, being mentioned by Varese as well, that when in a territory that there is illegality, corruption, that space will unavoidably be filled up by illegality, by bands, groups, or whatever. We are living. Well, this is uh, some uh, pessimistic opinion. We live in environments that are progressively more illegal, that are cannibalizing legality in a certain way. This morning, Barese was talking about or reminding us that we cannot finish drug consumption. We cannot forbid consumption. We cannot forbid prostitution. We cannot forbid all, the, all of these things. But, but since 2014, it's part of, of our Euro, European countries' riches officially, the profits of drug trafficking and other activities for me is prostitution are all part of the GDP of the countries of the European Union. So this is metabolizing or, or including certain aspects. Well, that is to say, we can forbid, but on the other hand, these crimes have are, many continue to be crimes. So therefore, legality or illegality of the context is a very important factor when analyzing how we, they can, the bands can colonize territories or wherever, in whatever city. They know about this. They take these factors into account they know that they will enjoy a certain benevolence or a certain uh, uh, legal treatment or police treatment. This is one of the factors for them to gain inroads into Catalonia, into Spain, because they bear this in mind, these factors, if these are territories that are favorable. So don't be surprised when I talk about organized crime, I associated this with the term legality. For me, this is fundamental. I think that education about the benefits of legality and what this means could give us more solid defenses against the penetration of these bands and reinforced our immune system and to decrease the degree of complicity and connivance uh, of a certain part of the citizens with illegal practices. Uh, I don't think we can eliminate the problem, but at least it would have difficulty the create of this diffuse space between legality and the criminal world. 
that is one of the characteristics that we have and maybe it would have contributed to get more citizens collaborating and this does not have serious consequences is a mistake there is never organized crime without corruption or the connivance without other if perverse effects on on living together that is why we need antibodies to immunize us against this infection we have to bear in mind its political action and i have to say i'm sorry to say that we have no proper education about the risks of illegal activities and this only sends things underground but let's not lose hope thank you very much thank you very much for this uh, brilliant talk inspired talk and i give the floor to Carlos. Spain. Good morning, everyone. Well, on our side, this is like the the bill for the light uh, for supplies. We receive interns which may be part of organized crime, and they come to us once everybody else has failed. Our organization, we are men and women working in rehabilita rehabilitation with the available means that we have. When we have a group of interns that come from the world of organized crime, this will be two or three delinquents that ha have organized an illegal business that have made money through an illegal business but that will make legal investments these people will enter prison and then most uh, the police corps and security areas identify to us who are these guys what was their role in these companies and from here we have to guarantee the the, the safety of our facilities and, and what we should do. If we think there is a high level of risk, we maybe should redistribute these interns in different penitentiary centers. And in the end, these uh, uh, interns will uh, advance to preventive measures. They will achieve uh, conditional release or they will uh, finish their sentence they will but some of them may decide that there is an opportunity for business within the prison because they can introduce drugs they can introduce mobile phones because a mobile phone is an office really uh, if I belong to an international criminal organization and I have a well a, a well organized structure and I have a person with a mobile phone within inside the prison, I have an office in prison and I can continue to manage my business. And that's when you run into problems because you need to have the sufficient, the necessary tools in order to control this situation. And that's where in terms of safety and security, we need to create uh, guidelines and protocols to identify these interns through monitoring. And we need to understand what they do. We need to understand what are their intentions. And that's where we see the need to introduce an element that we call risk and another element that we call intelligence management. We need to have a lot of intelligence, a lot of information, very 
well processed in order to be able to design the most adequate procedures, most of all to guarantee safety. And this may seem easy, but it is actually very complicated because these are things which are constantly changing. What should we do? And we need to train uh, prison staffs. We need tools. We're now beginning to use tools. We're creating uh, intelligence offices that process information and analyze information and return this processed information to all the stakeholders. Uh, both for uh, civil servants that work in prisons. My colleague, who is an expert, will now talk about how we do this, in which way we are working, because what we're doing now is to try and work, to try and find a new way of working based uh, most of all on uh, prison intelligence. And this is an effort that requires cooperation between internal teams and teams inside prisons, because that's the only way we can really control the security of um, prison. Because we're always talking, when we talk about safety in a prison, we think about static security, walls, cameras, infrastructure, but how about dynamic uh, security? security uh, as interaction with the prisoners. We need to understand what they think, what they feel, and all this information has to be collected, collated, analyzed, and, and so that we can act on this information. And so in very basic terms, this is what I wanted to explain. And now I wanted to give the floor to Carlas, who is an expert and will give you a more detailed view. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, to everyone here presentially, telematically. As Diego said, the first question that we need to frame because when we're talking, uh, we need to understand whether we're talking about a police environment or a justice environment. And we need to understand that the, in, in this environment, this is a very small world. And we need to take this into account And we also have to consider that in our area, we are responsible for uh, internal prison security. If there are any suspicions of a risk that may accept, affect our interior prison security, we need to refer this information to the responsible authorities. But we are concerned our risks, the risks we need to manage are the risks posed by the inmates which are in prison. So uh, based on these two premises, uh, well, maybe talking about intelligence might be a little too pretentious. Until now, we had problems and had to do with the concept of static and reactive security. And if there were problems, we wanted to isolate these problems, uh, create a disciplinary report, or sanction the, the inmate, and that would be it. That would be the end of the journey of this information, so to speak, and all the suspicions and all the indications that might have been identified in the process were when nowhere and nowhere further. When we realized that it was possible to analyze all this information, 
we realized that we could make a lot of progress if we moved from a reactive attitude to a preventive attitude. So preventive before risks materialize. And I'm talking about any type of risks because we will talk about our system now our security and, and internal supervision system. And then we will eventually come to discuss the specific risk of organized crime. But to draw a parallel between this proportion within the pen, penitentiary sphere, we have information that comes from penitentiary institutions. And at this moment, as far as we know, we only have about 200 people that from a sentence point of view have been identified as belonging to organized crime groups. Now, out of these 200 people, we, our system, our supervision and security system, out of these 200, there are 49 which have a risk of internal organized crime presence because uh, from the point of view of um, the sentence, we may know that this person is connected to organized crime, but this does not initially uh, imply an internal security risk for us. We need to analyze this information. We need to look for evidence of potential risk. We need to identify a profile and apply our own measures of internal security. All of this within a legal framework, of course. Now, this question is relevant because otherwise you might think that anyone entering a prison because of a murder or because of any other criminal activity should be supervised, but that's not the case. Mm, uh, from, a, from a criminal point of view, you're not entitled to do this uh, even for anybody who is connected to organized crime. So how do we, what do we do? We actively look for data and evidence that we analyze. And after that, we determine working with central services, whether this person meets all the, um, all the uh, requirements that we have defined to identify someone as uh, associated to risk of uh, organized crime. We can then activate this profile and the supervision supervision of this individual. This will not change the life of the inmate in any way, nor the classification of the intern. It will not have an impact on the normal life of this inmate. The inmate will continue uh, inside prison with the same classification that they had when they entered. The only thing we're going to do is is focus on this person from the point of view of supervision. So that if the time comes when we consider that it is appropriate, we will uh, adopt preventive measures to prevent any criminal activity from taking place inside the prison. And this is the system and the procedure that we have created. Now, the goals, as Diego said, are not just uh, this, uh, a very relevant part of this is informing and returning the information to uh, prison officers and all the personnel that works inside the prison so that they can focus on uh, working with this information they, everyone should be aware of the existence of these general risks 
and professionals, whether they come from internal prison system areas or rehabilitation prisons, they all have to uh, be informed that this person has been identified as um, associated to risk from this perspective. We're talking about organized crime, but there are other risks that could be perhaps more worrying, such as violence uh, uh, inside the penitentiary institutions. You may have a professor or a speaker that comes to work inside the prison. If this person doesn't understand that they are talking with someone that may have violent reactions uh, in, in a completely sudden way, they are at risk. And therefore, this is one of the goals of our system of penitentiary intelligence in general. Now, in connection with the specific question that brings us here today, we will now discuss what we do and how do we manage this specific part of organized crime. This is a more visual presentation where you can see more or less which is our system. There is research and analysis of information in order to create a profile that helps us uh, make a prediction of level of risk. The information is shared with uh, penitentiary officials and in this way, we decide how to, what, what actions have to be defined in terms of security measures that we will see now. This is very quick because as we said before, the in analysis of penitentiary intelligence is not done for every inmate. This would be on the one hand impossible in terms of the amount of work and it wouldn't be justified. So we only act on these profiles, either because we have previous information provided by uh, the penitentiary institutions or through the police or other bodies, but if we don't have any previous indications that help us put the focus on uh, a person for these reasons, if we can, if we have not received information or we have not found any evidence, we cannot activate this system uh, and we cannot start the uh, analysis of information in order to define a risk profile and we cannot apply any a security preventive measure. But if we do identify a risk profile, then this triggers all this um, procedure until we define internal security, implement internal security measures. Now this analysis is conducted taking into account all the legal requirements. It has to be, has to have a previous justification. There have to be guarantees regarding it privacy and data protection for these individuals. And there has to be a proportionality related to the level of risk that has been defined for this person for the in, from, from the internal security point of view. These are, there's a very quick look at the levels of risks we have identified 12 levels of risk. These are collective levels of risk that may impact the security of the uh, prison center or the people who, uh, or the officials that work in the prison centers, but not only um, penitentiary officials, but also any other person that interacts with institution and people that work with us uh, in, from a, rehabilitation perspective or other aspects. So all of the, all of the personnel that works in the penitentiary 
environment has to be protected. Now, very quickly, uh, risk of escape, uh, but this used to be managed with higher walls and, and more uh, systems, electronic systems for detection, redundant detection systems, etc. But that's all we used to do. There was, even if, if an inmate had attempted an escape, uh, well, he would receive a sanction and that was it. So we, there was a lot of information that we were not using, but now we do. Now we use this information, any evidence, any indication is analyzed, as we have explained. Non-compatibilities, this is a very specific uh, problem in penitentiary institutions. They may be disconnected to judicial sentences that oftentimes define non-compatibilities uh, between interns for whatever reasons. Two interns may have penitentiary non-compatibilities. Um, also, there are social non-compatibilities Basically, there are social groups or ethnical groups or cultural groups. It's hard to find an example. And sometimes there are non-compatibilities related to professional, uh, to people who work in the institution, to specific individuals. Um, Intra-institutional violence is, we have already discussed, this is a great source of concern with us. We need to identify high um, uh, levels of risk for potentially dangerous In my inmates. It's a very complex question. It may come, it comes as a shock to many because from a social point of view, we should evolve or you might think that people would evolve towards more educated uh, behavior, so to speak. Yeah, but some people have not been properly socialized. And in our, in our centers, we do see this patterns, people who are prone to violence, and this is one of our greatest concerns and greatest focus, focuses of attention. Now, illegal substance trafficking, Diego has already discussed, and the presence of organized crime, which is what uh, connects to the discussion here today. And lastly, this special significance uh, which is related to interns that may have induced, uh, for example, disorders or riots, and that for us continue to, to be relevant in terms of monitoring, because these are inmates that may have a leadership role in the uh, prison community, for example, and all of these things have to be considered. Now, more specifically, focusing on the question that brings us here today and discussing risks connected to organized crime, the definition, is, um, I will read it, you will see that there are a number of questions that have appeared before. We're talking about interns, which are part of an illegal organization, either internal or external, or when a radical ideology anything that represents a risk in terms of monitoring and analysis, there's nothing we should do if they're not doing anything. And this happens very often. 
the largest organized criminal groups that the police is aware of and that are judged and sent to prison generally are not active inside prisons for a very simple reason. And it makes a lot of sense for an organized crime group that uh, is involved in drug trafficking or or weapons trafficking. They don't have a business inside the prison. These groups at this level, these uh, people who may be leaders in the organization, they don't, the, the risk they may pose would be at this level that they continue to do business as usual with a mobile phone from within the prison. And we have had Borsacones, as Professor Veresi mentioned, and their uh, conduct, and not only them, but also the rest of the group that was in prison with them, and even those that were outside in the street, and what we saw was no activity, no problems, no incidents. I'm going to share an anecdote because I involuntarily was involuntarily involved in a story. That's a real case. One of these interns, a Borsacone, had a, during an ordinary search, the, the kind of ordinary searches that are conducted on a regular basis in prisons, we found that they had a notebook where he had um, bank account numbers, uh, uh, names, telephones, and all sorts of notes that for him were of vital importance. Now this was uh, confiscated and that Represent, that represented a great threat for him. One of the penitentiary officials, which found the notebook, by the way, uh, this person we could consider that was at, at risk because of having found the notebook. And it was a serious risk because these people pose or are connected to very high levels of risk. And they, violent activity is part of their normal lives. And somehow the police and the institutions had to supervise this individual in a very special way. And fortunately, this person had to be, was waiting trial in Belgium because of arms trafficking and also human trafficking, and he was extradited. But this is just one anecdote about one very large criminal organization with an individual who had been jailed in our centers and the danger in this case aroused because this notebook was found. Urban tribes as well, sometimes they interfere uh, in prison centers, but I have to say that they're not particularly active in general. They might be, but not as we also have extremist groups, radical groups that um, in order to give you a list which is not, doesn't include everyone, but by order of importance, you who have people involved in the jihad. They are not really an organized group. They are individuals who um, try to organize groups and that could pose a danger for the penitentiary center and also a risk for external security. And this is something that we need to monitor with the help of police, because this is a very uh, high and also uh, 
critical risk. In the end, what they all do is illegal substance trafficking and this type of things. Or you can also have extreme left political groups. Now, this is not the case here in Catalonia, but yes, from at a national, Spanish national level, you could have violent, radical, uh, anti-system inmates, but these are basically the different types that you may find in our prison environment from a point of view of internal security. Now, the activities uh, in which they may be involved, mostly it will be traffic extortion, this is one of the major problems that we have, and um, proselytism, whether right wing or left wing or jihadist, and the risk, which is important, that these groups might lead to riots that would pose a threat to the security, to the penitentiary center and penitentiary officials. And now to finish, I would like also to talk about the internal security measures and which would be the prevention in order to see in which way we could act before risk materializes. So all of the measures that you see here are those that are foreseen in the penitentiary environment. So we cannot act as if there were an illegal organized group. So the first of the measures that is basic or that it is uh, key to intelligence is observation. If with all of the rest of the services, communications, uh, work, uh, the cultural area, social area, if we do not receive data, indications, information, this uh, network that we have, we, we don't receive this, we cannot analyze or foresee or use this for actions, preventive actions. So it may seem evident, but it is essential in the specific case of organized groups. It is obvious that we have the uh, legal environment uh, that indicates and that has a type of possibility to manage the group, well, it, what do we do? It depends on the risk to separate these people, separate them, or to spread them into different centers so that the, they could be the soldiers, the military members of these associations, so to speak. So what do we do when we have identified a risk, we will people who are pro possible escapees, we begin to work with them or uh, work in the area of services because this is a, a critical area for escape. We will place him in an, another area where he cannot get in touch with an external organization with uh, controls, um, controlling their communication. This is very important. Uh, these external communication, external agencies have methods of communication from the outside. So we have to see and check that this uh, uh, does not happen, or that this uh, method of communication uh, um, does not allow them to have communications with, with it then also with uh, organized groups, criminal groups, or radical uh, activities. For example, a very 
significant part are uh, this takes place in prisons. So some of the limitations that were, we would use in the risk, uh, if the risk was imminent, this would be one of the measures. And then other protocols, for example, when they do external visits um, or visits from the outside, uh, that uh, members of these uh, associations in uh, going out to a, to a private clinic, for example, because if it's, if it's a penitentiary hospital or a public hospital, if they go to a private clinic, a dentist or whatever, they have had risk situations in the sense that the external support group is should be prepared or to in case this person wants to be freed and the last thing we would like to talk about is the institutional cooperation this has been mentioned before but this is absolutely essential that all of the penitentiary organizations police who are the first who get involved, then the legal system and all of the rest of our environment has to be informed, well coordinated and share all of this information because this evidently is beneficial to all of us. And uh, I will leave it at that because uh, Mark is uh, saying that I've run out of time. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. We will now, I think we can answer with this statement of which was uh, mentioned before that prisons can be like incubators of criminal activity and this was a very interesting comment. So now I give the floor to Mr. Luis Moreno Comendador, Head of Human Trafficking, uh, Central Prosecution Unit. We give you the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to give uh, uh, visibility to the police. Uh, I have a very brief uh, presentation. I will take advantage of these 20 minutes that I have to talk about a phenomenon that is known as a transnational activity, which is uh, human trafficking. Human trafficking um, is one of ac the activities that is recognized as international. So normally the victims are foreign, but there are also national victim. Uh, so we don't we can have victims within our borders they don't have to come from abroad it is very serious because it affects personal rights human dignity um, if a person loses their dignity well the worst is to lose their life and in the second place after that is dignity if they lose their dignity they stop living this affects freedom this affects sexual freedom and very important rights for people and i mentioned this because some there are criminal organizations that are behind this but we have to center on the victim we're working for the victim and we have to understand that the crime is what affects the victim. What it, we are most interested in is to protect the people, the victims. And from this point, we have to define the rest of our work. The human trafficking is cataloged as the second or third most lucrative business. First is drug trafficking and after that it's uh, people and weapons trafficking 
here we don't have excessive problems in Spain about with uh, arms, weapons, trafficking, but we do have with the trafficking of human beings. And it is not really very visible. I'm going to talk about mafias and I like referring to the word mafia because it's a strong word more than criminal group. Uh, it, I believe that is more illustrative when there are mafias. Uh, yes, that's what they are. Human trafficking is considered the um, slavery of our times. So, and here in Europe, this is legislated since the year 2000, relatively quite recently. In Spain, in the criminal code, it appears in 2010, that's even less years. And this is so complex uh, and to the different types of victims that there was a protocol for action, which is addressed to the police, to judges, lawyers, and other organizations to encourage these uh, investigation, how we have to investigate these type of crimes. Sometimes the victim is not seen as a victim, recognized as a victim. How can we help a person that does not want to be helped? So that is the, one of the first things. We have to look at the types of victim to see that maybe sometimes the victims do not do not see themselves as such. Then uh, there was another protocol that we did, which is the guide of good legal practices. Once we advance in the study of this crime, how can we approach um, the trial and the sentence and the punishment? Um, so this is that these people are, are punished uh, by the law. Um, I'm going to be very simple based on uh, police investigations. I'm going to try and portray what um, tra human trafficking is. So we always have the need to quantify things to see what is the magnitude of the problem, who is affected. These are uh, figures of 2008. Well, we the, the pandemic stopped the measurements, but this is the picture that we were talking about, we're looking at before. Um, this is the image that is not so precise because when they ask us and we get asked, how many victims are there in Catalonia? We don't know. We don't know because we have had victims of uh, stolen vehicles. This is registered, um, but not with human trafficking because people maybe don't know because they are threatened and they don't uh, dare to report this. And so we, we are working uh, on these figures. It has five finalities for five different uh, purposes for sexual exploitation. The percentage says that this is the most important percentage with that is 66 percent. 65, even 70%. The other, the second one is to be used for forced labor. So people who want, who have to work for in things for, to uh, oblige a person to sell drugs, to break the law. And there are two others. One is for organ trafficking we are not affected as a country, we don't have this, or at least not that we know of. And so, and the other one is forced marriages. And here we have more victims that we are able to find, but we are going to 
concentrate on sexual exploitation. These are the data of sexual exploitation. More than 70% of victims are women, 18% are girls, and then the rest is between adults, men, adult men, and children, boys. To understand this phenomenon of human trafficking, we have to understand people as merchandise uh, and they have brought them for a place where to another where they become a merchandise. So this is a legal activity done by the mafia. This is where the mafias play a role of this illegal business of transporting or, or trafficking in people. To understand this, there are four stages. First, we have to recruit or find the person, then to transport or, or, or this person where this person is uh, integrated into the mafia or into the work that they're doing. And so they have to take them to their destination and then exploit them so that they do an illegal activity that will uh, result in money. So with uh, recruiting more, mostly this is for sexual exploitation. Imagine in, in the country, Nigeria, West Africa, a population of 180, uh, 180 million people and a great part are uh, illiterate, Muslim, there's conflict, uh, they have uh, the problem of uh, oil production, and there's uh, voodoo and other pr uh, practices on the other part of the world. Then we have China, Taiwan, this is a region that is uh, half of Spain, but in a very small place. So they are, are trying to find the, the Chinese culture of working, working, working was born in this region of Fujian. So oftentimes we don't have to go that far. We can go to Romania, Albania, or any other place where there is vulnerability due to social inequalities, because what mafias are looking for are people who are vulnerable, people who don't have anything, and the mafias can offer something better than what they have. So if we have uh, a, 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 an apartment and we're looking for a house, well, they're looking for us, but if we don't have anything, and when I'm talking about that they have nothing is that they don't even have something to eat. So of course they are easy prey. And so how are they tricked? They are they are tricked, they are, it's very easy to trick people who don't have anything. And so this is something which is uh, violence, in, uh, masks violence, because they take advantage of prior experiences because this has happened since all times and people who have connections in Nigeria, they know of people who are in similar situation that have gone abroad and live better. And this is what the idea that they have, that people uh, abroad have money, can eat, to uh, for what price? Well, when you don't have anything, you are almost willing to do anything to feed your family. So what this is to uproot a person from the place they live and take them to a place where they are totally vulnerable. So this is an extract of a declaration with respect to recruiting a lady, offered another lady the possibility of going to Spain to work as a cleaning lady. And so this was sufficient reason to leave. You don't need anything more. Violence will come after uh, and this uh, 
does not have to be uh, physical violence. This can be subtle, as subtle as saying, okay, I know where your family lives and if you don't do what I do, well, something will happen to them. So that's all they need. Where uh, with respect to transfer, it's the same situation. You have to take a person um, and what do the, these companies want transport to be as cheap as possible? Mafias are in charge of transferring these people as economically as possible. So imagine bringing a girl from Nigeria to Spain. Transport is not by plane. Transport is walking and buses, trucks, or in the most cheap, in the cheapest way possible. It can last for months. And during these months, these people who are being trafficked don't have money, don't have money to buy food, don't have the knowledge to work in a country to earn money. They are continually being extorted, raped, uh, aggress they suffer aggressions, they are kidnapped. These are not Western style kidnappings. They are kidnappings where mafia uh, dedicated to transferring, to exploiting, uh, they are very well coordinated and these mafias uh, who traffic in people, who transfer people, when they have the girls who are going to embark or they, they, they kidnap them, that's just to talk to somebody and to, to take them away. You have to pay me more. So traffickers do this, they pay because they don't lose any money. This uh, just befalls on the, uh, at the expense of the person because they in, in, incur a debt and so they can ask them for 20, 30,000 euros if they have to, to uh, pay more, they will recover this later on. So this is what happens. Some who come by plane from other parts or in by car. And here we have to, we have to have visas, passports and state do not, uh, facilitate these documents, but mafias do. They do everything necessary so that these persons can travel to another per place where they can be exploited. So they can, uh, they lose their dignity because they don't have documentation. So if you don't know the language, if you don't know how things work, how society works, and you don't have your documents, then you are no a nobody, you lose your identity. Another call that we in, intervened was a trafficker was asking this person who is dedicated to transport people to ask for uh, life jackets, life jacket for each girl, not because of their safety, because they want them to arrive alive. And this is a merchandise and the merchandise has to arrive. And so these 50 euros are added to the debt of the girl. And that happens, they, they have their life jacket. What about integration or welcome when they arrive in the country of destination, um, which can take months, uh, and it's uh, a play time when all type of aggressions take place. When the victim comes, they give them the news that they are not expecting. You have this debt, you have to pay this debt, and the uh, uh, job that you were promised does not exist. So you have to uh, be a prostitute until you, pay your debt and then you will be free. And the debt is 20, 30,000 euros. And this debt has continued to grow because the people need, have living expenses. And so then this is, they have to pay for their maintenance. They have to pay their rent. And so the debt continues to rise. An example of a declaration, uh, 
or of what I was mentioning. So the person said there was no job, there was no job, and that what they had to do was be a prostitute in that apartment 24-7 uh, without a possibility of choosing when they rest, who the client is. So this is like a machine that has to produce and has to work continuously. And when they receive this news, then reality is there. So the, the, the ordeal that this uh, person has uh, passed and sometimes exploitation is like a liberation because they have suffered so much such an ordeal um, and so um, they have been raped they have been hungry and they get here and they find themselves living in a house with food and they have to be prostitutes but they have lost their dignity and so they in, in all of the process, they are in, in, the, in the best time. And so normally they don't let them go out of their apartments and they are confined there, confined. So you don't have to uh, uh, put chains on them just with a small being forceful if you don't uh, behave or do what I do, I will harm your family. This is just enough uh, to keep them uh, confined. And they they show them, they show them that they are uh, illegal immigrants, that they are illegal there, that if the police find out they will be deported, that they never should talk to the police. They, they shouldn't talk to people here. Uh, with other people, with uh, other organizations, because they will tell tell the police, and the police will send them to their country of origin, and so um, this is an example. Another call that was uh, interfered with this person was the person who was responsible of controlling the women of. Uh, and some who were uh, complaining or crying out uh, because of the pain. Uh, and so I'm talking about seven rapes in one hour. So in one hour, so we have to uh, uh, multiply this, uh, these victims. This is the situation that they are in. We cannot come, come and report because the, we can see what what we can do. We can we can't. We police has to use other organizations. We have to go and find the victims, but maybe a victim will be a rebel. I don't want to continue. And what can we do? What can we do as police when they are when they are threatened? Mafias control the origin. That is the main problem that we have. They control the source of origin. What can we do? We're talking about European police. What can we do if there is a mafia that is threatening uh, a girl with killing her family. We cannot do anything. We there are not pe places where we can go and interact. We we cannot protect the victim in their places of origin. But mafias do have this power of co of forcing. The most important part for prisons or the prison institutions is the last filter when everything else has failed. This are the five reasons, and these five reasons are contemplated in the and talk about sexual exploitation, but as a crime. So, 
to talk about these criminal activities in a broader context. So here, sometimes we do it, we cannot detect the victims. And if we are not able to detect the victims, they can be imprisoned. They, for example, in a, go to a, a marijuana plantation and find people there. And we have to arrest them and they don't talk about, they don't, they don't say anything. They don't have any information and they don't talk. So maybe they are part of a network of a mafia that has uh, trafficked with them to force them to uh, grow marijuana. We have to see if the girls who are stealing in the metro, uh, in, we know that they are there, maybe they are being forced to steal from the passengers. So when everything is failing and when they get to prison, these victims have to have the possibility that we know who they are. We work in prevention, we work with uh, uh, the legal system, with education centers to try and work on prevention, on detection. But when this does not work, it is very important that we focus on the victims because I am not used to, I don't know, the prisoners, the, the, the inmates very well, but we can uh, maybe distinguish them. So in the lower part of the pyramid, we have to concentrate on these people, these victims who are in prison because of this. So this is a risk that we have to bear in mind. So sometimes this is complicated, complicated to understand, complicated to detect. And when there are inequalities, there will be human trafficking because there will always be mafias that will do some all possible to transfer these people to a place where they can produce. And this is the difficulty. So as police, we see this uh, in, from three perspectives, prevention, social prevention, police prevention, people who dedicate themselves to these in health centers in education. We analyze data, intelligence is a key part. We have to understand what are the migratory routes, but we have to find out where they're trafficking. We have programs, algorithms that detect possible victims of, and we try and create more uh, information. And one of the, also looking because mafias want to make money and we have to, they, they, they hide this. So they, they use many methods to hide the, this money. So we have to do a lot of more, more research in this respect. We have to pursue the mafias following the money, the money trail. They are looking for money. They all have money somewhere and we have to find where the money is. And if we get to the money, we follow it to the leaders of the mafia. And this is when we will have success. Thank you very much. So thanks. And uh, now we will go on to questions. Um, question. Are there any questions here in this room? Yes. We do have some 
I think, written questions in the chat. So this, this is a, okay, I'm real, so. So you, the solution is to battle against mafias, against organized crime, criminal organization, what they use. What is the solution that you would suggest to battle against organized crime, okay? From all perspectives. Okay, I will look at the last comment of Mr. Moreno to look for the definitive solution. I think it's uh, it's an illusion, it's a uh, utop utopic, it's human nature. But in any case, looking at the different contexts, origin, etc we can always find an alternative way. So final, different, dif definitive solutions. I think I, this is quite complicated, but I think we have to find formulas to minimize the effects of organized crimes. What he has talked about is terrible. It's terrible. So I think that this aspect of non-quantified pain has to be contemplated by us. We have to be able to empathize with the victims, not uh, the, the victims uh, from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America. So the idea of legality, equality, all of these principles, the doctrines of the 21st century strengthen us and make us to uh, look at this to, to, to look at what is illegal, of what is a criminal, um, and what are these acts by the mafias. So I don't have solutions. I think that the conditions of the, in the different continents are contributing more and more to encourage these other ways, economic, escapes or work escapes, we don't have a lot of moral authority because people like the city or financial centers are the end destinations of all of the money that comes from organized crime. So we have to remember this. Uh, mafias have diversified, they have understood even before the rest of society that diversification was a way to conceal. Mafias are present in all of the conflicts, in all of the crises, because these cr crises are always a place where mafias can flourish. When we've talked about our time, time is like a change. If we analyze each, uh, each uh, these, these uh, links of the chain, they are all there. So we can talk about the pandemic, we can, talk about organized crime in these years of the pandem pandemic, especially in areas like Latin America, is, is enough to written a book. They have substituted the state 
not just with respect to the distribution of medicines, but also social help. The clans have been helping you know, to obtain higher levels of consensus and acceptance and trust, always going back to the issue of trust. I ask myself, this is another question that I should have with Barese. With respect to the Ukrainian war, what are the roles that Russian mafia are playing between uh, conflicts between the mafias, the Russian mafias? What are their interests in the energy uh, sector? They are there in all of the conflicts in, in the after the big earthquakes in Italy, the mafias have always been there when the business of large migrations, mafias as are always have been there. And I think that in the same way that when countries such as Italy faced political terrorism, they, they knew how to finish. Mafios do not have any problem with ideology. This is, there are economic uh, motives. So this is the pathological accumulation of money and money, unfortunately, is highly linked. So this is a scenario where they and their accomplices, um, so the theory of, of mafia as a cancer that arrives uh, to a healthy place and, and, and thrives and transform this uh, paradise into some something terrible, I think that this could uh, be comforting, but that is not the case. That is not the case in the case of marijuana. There are gardeners, uh, real estate agents, uh, drivers, etc that are in and even lawyers or public notaries that are representing this. So this is, we're going to be more autocritical and to see they, their accomplices are live in our cities, live in our society are part of our economy. We, so they have to be able to launder their money, their profits. So we have to look for definite solutions. Once again, I think this is uh, utopian. I think what authority, the civil society, what they can do, uh, is, is a social problem, as has been seen through with the different uh, speeches. So it's a great challenge. It's a great challenge. So we demand goods and services. They would not exist to this extent. So. Therefore, a good start would be to think of ourselves, to try and be more empathetic and to know how to look at the profits of, of being illegal and then to go on to more explicit territory, to know how to move, to be aware of the effect this has on our lives because Barcelona 
obviously has a social political context that is very different to Latin America or some other European countries or African countries. In these, the mafias condition the life of millions and millions of people. So, so uh, different methods in, 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 in the legal system, in the market system. And so we have to start with ourselves. We have to be more uh, strict with our governance to struggle against corruption. We all know that these processes, such as the case of marijuana, have to overcome different stages. And we have seen that the index of violence in, in the police is more is, is greater. So we have to be strict with all of these agents. These are also ways to help. We have many ways with this vision, this, which mentions Colombia, Russia. If not, we won't really advance. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think there are further questions. And let's remember that in order not to uh, go beyond our schedule, we have to stick to short questions. Yes, I've been working as a social worker for uh, 23 years in different centers. And something that is very, we have just four people in the prison. We have people that are, they are not, they're, it's difficult for them, it's difficult. So, so the issue is that people, women from Nigeria that we have for women trafficking with victim, they are the first victims and they want to do the same. These women are the women that we have in prison. I'm not saying that the police, but the police are uh, concerned about what's happening, but there are always these people who go to prison, but I've never heard of the dismantling of any banks, European banks, American banks that was uh, that had to close because it laundered money from drug trafficking, weapon trafficking, or whatever. So we are lo we're working in the, uh, the the people of the last resort, the last resource. These people, the victims, and we don't uh, have. Uh, sufficient payment for dealing with these uh, elements of society that this is like the the drains of society so it's not really a question it is a comment a thought why do we <coughs> work with these people and nobody bothers to find what is happening further up in the banks in the government in the different uh, government agencies why we always talk about uh, talking about equality, liberty, etc., and everything we have learned in school, but then we forget about them because this is the last. Well, of course, you can die, but prison is the last resort. So, why to prevent? We're talking about prevention, but we're talking about we're talking about prevention at the prison at the last place in society. So as a professional, I think that 
something is not being done well as a society. Thank you very much. So I think uh, we're, I think it's more a thought, a comment. Uh, and, and so we have to think about this. I don't know if there's another question. Yes. If we still have time, we'd like to congratulate all of the speakers for, for what they have said, their explanation of your experience. I would like to ask a question to Luis Moreno. I really liked your, uh, what you've talked about, your, what I, something that I don't understand is how do they get to your unit? Do you, you collaborate with schools or you talk about the fact that it's very complicated that they go and report the crime or to the police because they are threatened or threatening their family. So how those cases that do get to you, how, how do they get to you? Well, sometimes I don't understand how they get to us because the situation, I, I would not dare, I would not dare. But many times they come because they, because of other, other crimes that they've committed, petty crimes, of a, a rape in the street, or if the police that was there or the medical professional that was there have been able to get their trust and maybe they, 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 they brought her here to, to be a prostitute and, and she didn't want to. So sometimes there are some victims that come to report. There are organizations, NGOs that uh, try and help these victims. And one of the tasks they do is to explain to this victim that we can look at, that they have to come to the police so that we find out about the organizations because they, they shouldn't see the police as an enemy. They, uh, and it's very difficult for them to arrive. That is why one of the things that we do is we go out looking for victims, look in areas where maybe there can be these, uh, uh, because prostitution and uh, sexual exploitation um, coexist. And so we have to look at the shops or certain shops and or, so that is where we try and find them. But in their thought about why, how they come to report the crime, it's, it's sometimes I don't understand that either. Apart from the clients, do you get information or reports or from others, from people who know? No. This is something different. It's another hot potato is, is uh, uh, prostitution, but um, I think we are all clear on the fact that women don't exert uh, prostitution willingly. Whether they, but if, if they come from South America, 18 years old, and they are working in a, in an apartment and exercising prostitution, we all come to the conclusion that this is not is uh, something that they do willingly. So we know that, but what about those who consume prostitution? Well, this inf they, 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 they don't report, they, this information does not arrive. I know that there are more questions, but just there are a lot of information in the chat. And I think that sometimes these the questions uh, that have already been answered, but there are two very specific ones that I can find in the chat. Is there a kind of information about participation of in searches in prisons in other countries? Do we have this information? And the other? 
and I think this is from a person who is within the system, some difficulties with respect to data protection when trying to have access or find out about relevant information. Do we have data, comparative data from other prisons or, in, or in, from other countries? Yes, we do have some references, but uh, we have been developing a electronic tool for research, but not from the determination or the resolution. But yes, when we're talking about the data, we have had contact with some penitentiary centers in the UK and so they are working on these statistics and they see a brisk in this activity but let's say that our system of uh, prison intelligence is part of this project with respect to data protection. Yes, it's something that concerns us all. Yes, one of the guarantees that we uh, are clear about is that when we analyze data and these uh, criteria and uh, create a profile, we always have to guarantee uh, uh, the, the law, the data protection laws. But now that we have uh, this, the uh, definitive law of uh, 2021 that uh, talks about police activities with respect to the data protection. And I have to say that we're, we are talking about risk profiles and always we have to guarantee data protection and this validates, so to speak, the possibility of looking at risk profiles. but always within or motivated by uh, just as when we do a search procedure, we, we always follow the premise of special motivation. <laughs> So the tool that we're working with looks at or emphasizes communications between different organizations that share this information and that this is completely confidential, that there is no type of filtration of this information. So we are also in contact with a program of cybersecurity of the government of Catalonia. Um, okay, thank you very much. And please excuse us if uh, somebody has asked a question through the chat. Um, and if we haven't answered it, um, I think we it's uh, no, no, that the, the, this uh, subject is poses a lot of questions and a lot of interest. So then I ask Professor Armand Balcells to officially close this meeting. Mark.
Hola. Molt bona tarda a tothom, senyores i senyors. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be very brief to be able to close, finish on time. Thanks to everyone here, people here, uh, presentially, people that are following us through Zoom. I'm going to take a bit of an extra time to thank the organizers of these meetings, the Center of Legal Studies, the university. Thank you for uh, making this possible. Uh, thank you to everyone, Professor Varese, all of the rest of the speakers, and especially thanks to those of you who are showing interest either presentially or online something that emotionally makes me very happy of the is that we wanted to touch on this matter for quite a long time we are aware that this causes a lot of interest when we're talking about organized crime we're talking about a very big paradox. We have many things that are telling us what organized crime is. We have seen this as a cultural product, these cells. This is something that concerns governments, but it is highly complex and can determine many of the actions. We promised you all organized crime and if we look at all of the cases that independently have come out from Mr. Varese's intervention to the last intervention of Luis Moreno, we have talked about Russia, we have talked about Italy, we have talked about Somalia, Nigeria, prisons, etc. So therefore, this is like a monolith of organized crime that is present directly or indirectly in our lives. But as a paradox, do we know the prevalence? Do we know the incidence? This is all very complex matter to answer because of problems that uh, are there, for example, one that uh, can is is there is uh, the problem of detention many of these conducts are done not to be detected such as any other type of predatory crime that we can suffer so the problem of organized crime is that it's transnational and from the statistical point of view, it's very complex to know where we have to place responsibility because this is highly complex. Where does it start? Where, what country does it start in? What country does it finish in? in? Mr. Moreno is here, but because there are transnational elements that are taking place. Uh, we're talking about this globalization, this mixture between the local and the global. Another difficulty is that these are conducts that are continuous in time. These organizations, as Professor Vares has said, are, were not born for a certain mission uh, and then finish. No, in many of the def definitions, the element of continuity is one of the main criteria to define organized crime. And I have gone to the second problem, which is that one of the criminologists that is understood working on this is that there is an industry of definitions of what and what isn't organized crime. In some of her articles, she said def definitions, etc. There are more than 300 definitions. One of the academics that studies this, that uh, Johnson Lampre, has a web page where he has an encyclopedic definitions, list of definitions. And so we're not talking about something simple as a theft. Uh, there are many organizations from, from a 
point of view of legislation, what is a, a theft? But here we're talking about a monster, like a hydra with many heads, when very varied forms of activity. So each uh, uh, response to the situation of a certain culture or a country or whatever. So the cultural element is something that we have to bear in mind, but not the basic element that defines this conduct. And then we get to the problems from the point of view of police force, of legislation, of the penal system, whether it is here or in other countries, it is very difficult to arrive at a definition that in a cohesive way talks about this phenomenon of transnational organized crime. We have to talk about this. This has been researched for many times people in, of the School of Chicago, people who in the 50s were already researching about the American uh, organized crime, etc. The def international definition of through the Palermo uh, Convention, which is the protocol of organized crime, this definition is from the year 2000. So it's complex to get to a definition and it takes time because people who have the power is are slow, slower than the speed of organized crime and the way they figure out how to break the law. So when we're talking about COVID, COVID, we have had examples and how a group can adapt itself, especially if they are online, offline, or with when they can use different data from hospitals or, or so they are winning the game. We also talked about ethnography, work in the field, the, the need to have methodologies and empirical research. This is all complex. We're not talking about something that we can do simply. We're talking about people who belong to organized crime is very complex because this involves having to find them without risking and to really find how to work. And so this is very complex from the quantitative point of view. We've already said that the problem that it is a activity that continues in time makes it very difficult to have quantitative statistical data. We have also invited uh, Yamandip who had try, has tried to create an index of the variables that are more frequent. For example, numbers of murders, unresolved murders. Uh, because if we remember all of these, the criminological data, this is very complex. We know that from the victim's point of view, it's very difficult that these victims report these activities from the point of view of the authors to working, interviewing. This is difficult. There are problems of security, ethical committees, etc. And so but one thing has been clear through all of the speeches, and this is that it is so broad because everybody has mentioned this, the breadth uh, of, of, we've talked about all of this to from the problems of police, the prisons, the journalism, this is a phenomena that it goes beyond what these individual organizations are capable. So, you know, we have been in contact with this because of corruption, consumption of substances or whatever. So this is research that it is absolutely necessary because we have this 
aspect dichotomy, which is on offline. So uh, online gaming has been very uh, easy, good for them. And there are a lot of topics that are secretive. One of the things, some of colleagues that uh, were commenting that you don't even have to go to deep web because you can do this in on authorized uh, um, networks. So as you have seen uh, here, this is uh, very seriously, and I would like to finish this intervention, closing intervention, by talking about the importance of this type of research in international conferences. We have to dedicate panels of this nature. And so it seems that our problems uh, begin and start at home, but we know that this is not the case. So I think that this is our first step. This is an ecosystem where everybody involved from academics, the public sector, have to try and help each other out in order to determine what we were saying. The dimensions that form the shape of this monolith known as transnational organized crime. So we hope that this is a step in the right direction. And just through your attention um, that we have had, we know that this is the case. This is uh, um, a good thing, a good step. I don't know if you want to say something else to officially close this meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Hope to see you next year with something uh, interesting. Um, thank you very much.